Okay. House come to order. Members, our prayer today will be given by Scott Shepherd. Scott is the Auburn University baseball chaplain. He's a guest of Chairman Lover. Good morning. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, this is the Lord, the day's Lord, the day of the Lord. We thank you so much for this day. It is the day you have created. We give you praise, honor, and glory. I thank you that all authority is established by you, and everyone in this room represents the people of Alabama. So I pray for wisdom. I pray for direction. I pray you would lead and guide them all for your glory, your honor, and your praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us. Member Day's Pledge of Allegiance be led by Sutton Wells. He's a sixth grader at Helena Middle School. He is the guest of Representative Halsey. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good job. Clark Colerell. Mr. Speaker, Allman, Baker, Bedsole, Blackshear, Bolton, Boyd, Bracey, Brynjark, Brown, Butler, Carnes, Chestnut, Clark, Klaus, Collins, Colvin, Crawford, Daniels, Drummond, Dubos, Easterbrook, Ellis, England, Hensler, Estes, Faulkner, Fiddler, Fincher, Fort, Garrett, Gidley, Gavan, Gibbons, Gray, Hall, Hammett, Harbison, Harrison, Hassel, Hendricks, Hill, Hulk, Jones, Hollis, Halsey, Hurst, Ingram, Jackson, Jones, Keel, Kirkland, Lamb, Lands, Lawrence, Lee, Lipscomb, Lomax, Lovern, Marcus, McCampbell, McClammy, Mooney, Moore M, Moore P, Morris, Oliver, Paramore, Pascal, Pettis, Pringle, Rafferty, Ream, Reynolds, Rigsby, Robbins, Robertson, Sellers, Sells, Shaver, Shaw, Shed, Shiree, Simpson, Smith, Sorrells, Stothagen, Standridge, Starnes, Stringer, Stubbs, Tillman, Travis, Treadaway, Underwood, Wadsworth, Warren, Whit, Horton, Wilcox, Wood D, Wood R, Woods, Yarborough. Sixty members have answered roll. The House is ready to transact business. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Lee, Chairman Lovern. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I request that leaves of absence be granted for absent members. Are there any objections? Hear no objections. Members are excused. The chair further recognizes the gentleman from Lee, Chairman Lovern. Mr. Speaker, I have a report. House of Representatives, your standing committee on rules begs leave to report that it has carefully examined the journal of the House for the 18th legislative day and finds the same to be correct. Signed, Representative Joe Lovern, Chairman. Mr. Speaker, I move that the reading of the journal at length for the 18th legislative day be dispensed with. Any objections? Hearing no objections, the reading of the journal is dispensed with. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Mobile, Speaker Pro Tem Pringle, for the purpose of making announcements. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, let me make my motion, then I'll read this and we'll take a moment. Is that all right? Okay, Mr. Speaker, I move that when we adjourn today, we leave the journal open for the clerk to complete his business and that we reconvene on Tuesday, April the 9th at 2 p.m. 2 p.m. next Tuesday, April the 9th. All in favor say aye. Any opposed? Motion prevails. Mr. Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to read this to you. This is a very important, and I think we should all listen to it. Yesterday and today marks the 50th anniversary of the 1974 super tornado outbreak that struck Alabama, 12 other states, and one Canadian province. 
According to the National Weather Service records, 77 Alabamians died in the tornadoes on April the 3rd and April the 4th, and more than 900 people were injured. The town of Gwynn was all but destroyed in an F5 tornado that weather forecasters said was possibly the most intense storm to ever hit Alabama. The 200 plus mile an hour winds even moved the concrete foundation of homes. That storm was at least one mile wide when it cut a path through Bankhead National Forest and the damage to the forest could easily be seen from space. The towns of Jasper and Coleman were also heavily damaged, as were many other communities between Lamar County and Madison County. The April 3rd and 4th, 1974 super tornado outbreak ranks amongst the worst in Alabama history behind the April 27th, 2011 outbreak that killed 238 people and the March 21st, 1932 storms that killed more than 270 people. Thanks, Ms. Pro Tem. The one thing I'd ask uh, Representative Rigsby, if he would, to come down. You know, today marks the day of the tornadoes that went across the state and all of us has been affected. I know, especially in my district, uh, you know, we've lost lives because of tornadoes. But we also got members in our gallery that's got family that's, uh, that's suffering with health issues and some things going on. and. I'd uh, gotten a message from Corey Harbison last night. And he's uh, his young child that was born just not recently is having some serious health issues. And I know, uh, you know, we continue to pray for those that we know about with Amy and with Rick Reem's wife and with uh, Steve's wife and there's a number of others that affects us immediately as a family inside this body and inside this room. So at this time, I'd ask uh, Philip Rigsby, if he would, to give us a moment of prayer, and then please keep all these family members in mind as well. Uh, if you would, pray with me. Gracious Savior, Lord, we pause as we do work today uh, in this appointed position that you put us in, reminded of the fact that life outside of this chamber goes on. And that all of us have burdens and issues, things that we carry in our personal lives. Lord, so I lift those up at the feet of your throne this morning as we contemplate your sovereignty in all of creation. And we remember the 1974 tornadoes and the victims of those events. Lord, we're reminded that uh, pain is a part of life. Loss is a part of life. Hurt is a part of life. But you are the great mighty God. You are the God that creates it all, that sustains it all by your mighty right hand. And so we trust in the fact that you are on your throne and that you are intervening in all these circumstances in past, present, and future. Lord, and we pause now to remember those that are affected in this family of this body. Uh, the brothers and sisters that I call brothers and sisters in this body, Lord, and the hurt and the things that are going on in their life, whether it be sickness, specifically uh, with Corey Harbison and, and their child, Lord, I pray that you intervene in this moment. Even now, reach down your hand because we know that you are able uh, to work in this situation and we pray that your will be done. And there's others from uh, Eden and uh, Ben Harrison's wife's surgery tomorrow, Amy Stotthagen. Lord, there's so many that if we just went around the room, we all have a need. So we put all of that at your feet this morning. We lift up those requests. We are thankful for the opportunity opportunity to live life together in this chamber. Lord, politics aside, this is not eternity, and we're thankful for that. Eternity is yet to come, and you will reign mightily on the throne, no matter what is done in this chamber today or here forward. Eternity is what matters. So I pray even now that if there's one in this chamber or one hearing my voice that does not know you as not just Savior, but also Lord, I pray that they will learn this day, because today is the day of salvation, that you sent your son to die on the cross for their sins. You love them, you want a relationship with them, and all that you do is ask that you will just, we will surrender our lives unto you. So Lord, be with us now, be with those that we've lifted up today. You know the unspokens, you know the things that have been spoken, so we lift those up to you this morning. Lord, forgive us where we fail you, we love you, and we thank you for all that you do and provide for us, and in your name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, Carter.
Mark, we'll now receive reports from standing committees. We'll see those reports throughout the day. The House is now in position to introduce bills and resolution. Chair recognizes the general from Lee, Chairman Lover. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that we suspend the rules provide for immediate consideration of three time sensitive resolutions that are currently in the Rules Committee. You've heard the motion. All in favor of suspending the rules for consideration of the resolution say aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. Clerk now will call the first resolution. House Joint Resolution 132. Move for adoption. And all those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? It has been adopted. Ms. Clerk. House Joint Resolution number 150. Move for adoption. And all those in favor say aye. Any opposed? It is adopted. Mr. Clerk. Senate Joint Resolution number 24. Move for adoption. And all those in favor say aye. Any opposed? It has been adopted. The House now receives the last resolution from the Committee on Rules. Clerk will read those resolutions. Or by Representative Underwood recognizing the Honor Foundation and retired Navy SEAL Lieutenant Commander Richard Clifford for their dedication to the United States Special Forces. House Joint Resolution Number 145 by Representative Mooney commending Belle Casey for her dedication to bringing awareness of ALS. House Joint Resolution Number 146 by Representative Bedsole commending Gabe Hickson-Baugh on winning the NCAA Division II 133-pound wrestling national championship while representing the University of Montevallo. Senate Joint Resolution Number 40 by Senator Allen, commending Coach Robert John Sproul for his outstanding head coaching career at Shelton State Community College. Senate Joint Resolution Number 41 by Senator Coleman Madison, celebrating the Alabama Delta Days on March 21st, 2024. I move adoption. <laughs> All those in favor of the resolutions in mass say aye. Any opposed? Ayes have the resolutions are adopted. Clerk call next resolution. House Resolution Number 143 by Representative Shaw establishing the Alabama-Japan Legislative Exchange Group. I move adoption. And all those in favor say aye. Any opposed? It is adopted. Got one more. Ready? Yeah. Got one more. Clerk call next resolution. House Joint Resolution Number 149 by Representative Ledbetter, naming a portion of Alabama State Highway Route 117 in DeKalb County, Alabama, the Chief Buddy R. Crabtree Memorial Mile. I move adoption. All those in favor say aye. Any opposed? It is adopted. <laughs>
Good. How are you? All right. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Lee, Chairman Lovern. Hey, Mr. Speaker, I have a resolution. Clark, say the resolution. House resolution number 151 by the House Rules Committee. The special order calendar. Chairman Levin, you're recognized. Move for adoption. All those in favor say aye. Any opposed? It is adopted. Mr. Clerk, I think we've got a message from the Senate. We don't pull out of the basket. Message from the Senate, Mr. Speaker. The Senate has amended as therein shown and as amended has passed the following House bill and returned same here with to the House of Representatives. House bill number 151 signed Patrick Harris, Secretary of the Senate. Chairman Blackshear. Thank you for the recognition, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I make the motion to non-concur on HB 151. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? And go to conference. Motion carries. And go to conference. <laughs> Conferees for 151 will be Chairman Blackshear, Chairman Witt, and Sam, Representative Sam Jones. Okay. Chairman uh, Blackshear, I've had a request to maybe a few explanations of some of the issues that you have with this. Um, well, after reviewing it, um, I think the biggest thing, number one, is that how the Senate has the educate the lottery, I, if you use the lack of the word education, the lottery is split a third, so 100% of the lottery is not going to education. So I think that's that's the number one thing there. Um, also, I think we were leaving approximately four to five hundred million dollars annually on the table that we need to figure out how we can grab some of that. And if you look at a licensing perspective, you're leaving about a billion and a half dollars on the on the floor as well. And people want to know our folks back. I'm only asking for public consumption. What, and, and, and Jackson very suddenly agrees with me. He's like, yes, yes. So my question is, for public consumption, <laughs> can you just say why you think we're missing that $400,000 mark? I think, $400 million mark. No, I, my perspective, um, just for me is, I think we need to have some detailed conversation with the Senate conferees so we can have those conversations mm -hmm. while we think mm -hmm. there because they had it for three weeks. We worked on it for 15 months. Mm -hmm. And I think there's some details we can provide to them that may help them understand why we sent the package that we did to them. Okay. I just want to right. get Thank you. some understanding. Chair, thanks a lady. Ms. Clerk, call up the next message from the Senate, please. 
Message. Message from the Senate, Mr. Speaker. The Senate has amended as therein shown and as amended has passed the following House bill and return same here with to the House of Representatives. House bill number 152 signed Patrick Harris, Secretary of the Senate. Okay. Chairman Black, Chair. Thank you for the recognition, Mr. Speaker. I ask that we non-concur on HB 152 and go to go to conference. Chair, recommendation from the sponsors to none concur. All those in favor say aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Conferees on that committee will be Chairman Blackshear, Chairman Witt, and Mayor Sam Jones. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, gentlemen. Clerk call first bill on special work calendar. On page 16 of the calendar, House Bill number 167 by Representative Sells relating to consumer protection. Representative Sells, before you start, I've got a couple of things I need to bring up. First, Pebble and Warren, I know she's got a lease. So let's get, she wants a moment of personal privilege, one. And while she's making her way down here, would you mind stepping up to the mic for me, Representative Sells? Yeah, and and let's let's give her a happy birthday. Holly, Today is also her birthday. Can you turn my mic off, Holly? Let's go. Y'all ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Pedlin. Happy birthday to you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and for the um, privilege of saying, you know, uh, truly today is a day that the Lord has made because I have 72 years to rejoice that I've been here. So I, I, I am very, very thankful. Um, I just wanted, I couldn't let the day go by without taking the time to take a moment to pause. On my 16th birthday, Dr. Martin Luther King was killed. I will never ever forget that day. So I would just ask if all of you please stand and give a moment of silence for the life of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair, thanks a lady. Chair recognizes uh, Chairman Sales. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, uh, HB 167 is a bill we passed out here last year. It's a cell phone consumer protection for keep children from accessing porn on their cell phone. It's as simple as when they set up their Apple ID, they put their age in and it automatically turns the filter on. They actually are doing it now for ages 12 and under, and this just moves it up to the age of 18. Are there any questions, Mr. Speaker? If not, I ask for B. Hour. Okay, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Shelby, Reverend Mooney. Thank you, sir. Representative Sells, <clears throat> I want to thank you for a lot of years of hard work on this topic. Yes. We both share an interest in a national organization that's been very hard pursuing trying to put this protection in place. And, you know, from inception to now is like, I think you and I were conversing five years. What a blessing. Thank you so much. Thank you. I reached out to them five in 2019 to ask for their help. That's right. It's Thank been you. a time. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Talladega, Representative Robbins. Uh, Representative Sales, I want to tell you I appreciate all the work you've done to protect children. Thank I you. think we've had multiple conversations on 
The problem that we have in this country, in our society, where whether it's pornography or images that children shouldn't see, they're being exposed to. And I think we even discussed that we need to do everything we can to protect them. So that means you throw everything you can at the wall, whether that's the bill that I proposed, this bill, or some, uh, some other idea or another idea. But I think your bill, my bill, all the bills that we can come up with to fight this problem in our society is a good thing. Right, and it I, is a problem, and I appreciate your bill as well. Thank uh, you. And, and I just appreciate you, and I just, you know, I think that we've got to do something. I'm, I'm glad that you've taken the issue on, and you're working on this issue, and I, I wish the best of luck to you, and, and I wish the best of luck to us trying to fix this problem we have. Right. So thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Mobile, Representative Bracey. Be the third person to speak on the BR. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker, with Zinnamon Hill. Yes, sir. I just want to say I'm, I'm very proud for you to, to bring this. This, to me, is probably the most important bill for us to vote on this year. I, put, I agree. Um, you, you know my concerns about this from last year, and, you know, as a father of a now 12-year-old daughter, you know, this is something that's been really, really important to us in our house. Um, some of these apps on some of these games will lead these kids down rabbit holes. And once these kids go down these rabbit holes, they see things that they can never unsee. And, you know, I've dealt with that situation when my daughter was 11 and trying to make sure that we get her in the proper counseling. We, we're trying to reverse some things that has happened and it's a very difficult situation, and it's all because some people just don't want to be accountable. Um, it's, it's not hard to do. You know, when these phones are purchased, these things can be done right there at the store, and they make it seem as if we're asking them to do some of the impossible right. when it comes down to protecting our kids. And, you know, this is, like I said, this is the most important thing that I could possibly vote on as a young father of a young daughter that has been exposed to something like this on a phone. And then people will say, well, it's the parents. Like, what about the parents? You know, I think I'm a great parent. And, um, but it's not about that. These, these devices are opening up your homes and you don't even know. You don't even know the exposure that your kids are under. Like even right now, uh, because of safety with, with us working out of town, um, you know, my, my daughter has to have a cell phone, but I have to pay for an app called Covenant Eyes to make sure that I can help monitor what she can and cannot see, what she can search for and things like that. But it's putting a, an extra unfair burden on the families when this is something that can be taken care of up front. That's right. And a lot of families, yeah, my family can't afford to, to pay for Covenant Eyes, and, but a lot of families can't. And the fact that, you know, people would fight against this, you know, I think it's very shameful. Uh, it's shameful for companies that are just wealthy organizations to fight against this when it's our children are being exposed. And it's just because a lot of it starts from just playing on the app. It may be Roblox, or it may be something like that that just carry these kids down these rabbit holes and then, how do we how do we take back what they saw at such a you young age? You, you can't take it back. So you know, thank you for allowing me to be a co-sponsor. Um, I remember the day that you dropped the bill. Uh, you was looking for me because right. you knew that this was something that I wanted to be a part of. So you know, I'm honored to be a co-sponsor on this bill, and um, and thank you for bringing it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Chair, thanks the gentleman. Chair, recognize the lady from Jefferson, Representative Van. Be the fourth person to speak on the BR. Thank you for bringing this bill. Bringing this bill. Let me just tell you something. I see so much with these, our young folks, our kids, that starts with this one thing, and that's a cell phone. 
and access to cellular data and those platforms. My niece, I gave her everything in the world that she wanted growing up, but it was one thing I would not give her, and that was a cell phone to this day. However she got it, she wasn't going to get it from me. I have a problem with kids even having some cell phones in schools, and I would hope that we would, as we move forward, look at looking at some legislation, since we're making rules and passing legislation to put, uh, put in place job descriptions that we ban cell phones from schools um, uh, in the hands of kids at schools, but also in doing so, making sure that the, the schools are equipped with phones in the classroom, as many of them are in case of em emergencies. But I just really feel that we should get to a point where we should probably create another mechanism for children to have access to cell phones, uh, a phone in school, but not a cell phone. Um, I think that is critical to the survival of our children. Uh, as I've mentioned, even down to just issues of not just pornography, sex trafficking, as well as imagery, what they see on social media and these social media platforms. And so I just hope that as we move about and we begin to build a base for passing this type of legislation, and again, I never stand here to say I'm here to regulate morality, because that's not my role as a legislator. But to safeguard as it relates to our children right. and the youth of our our state, I just think that's just imperative. And this is just something that I've preached all my life with regards to kids and access, um, and especially to electronics, videos, cell phones, and things of that nature. All right, thank you. Yeah, so I just want to thank you for bringing this bill. Thank, thank you. you. Thank sure, thanks, a lady. Question for the body now is the adoption of the BIR, clerk on lock machine, the members will vote. <laughs> So, clerk lock machine, court of those, 98 I, zero nays, HB, the BR has passed on HB 167. Mr. Speaker, at this time, I ask for a final passage, HB 167. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Morgan, Representative Yarborough. Thank you for the recognition. I actually had it on for the BIR, but I just wanted to say thank you for bringing the bill. I've got four kids, 15 down to four, and um, uh, it just means a lot to have more security in place for the minds of my kids, so thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Question for the body is final passage of HB 167. Work on lock machine and the members of vote. <laughs> Clerk lock machine court vote 98 I zero nays. HB 167 has passed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, members. Thank you, gentlemen. Clerk, call the next bill. On page 20 of the calendar, House Bill number 211 by Representative Keel relating to traffic infractions. Representative Keel, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, this bill would require law enforcement to notify uh, parents or guardians in the case of a traffic infraction by a minor. And so currently in Alabama, uh, if your child is pulled over, uh, and gets a traffic infraction, you would not know about it unless for some reason you had to pay for it. And so if they were able to pay for it themselves, uh, you wouldn't know about it. But this would allow law enforcement to notify a parent if a minor receives a traffic infraction. Mr. Speaker, I ask for the BIR. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Mobile, Representative Stringer. 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 You got your light on? You got your light on? Is your light on? You're up. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The oh. gentleman you. For 32 years, you know, and a father of six children, I absolutely appreciate this and get it. Uh, I don't think it's too much to ask for an officer to attempt to reach out to a parent and try to let them know you know, I've had, I've got uh, five children of driving age and I have 
gotten a piece of mail that said one of my children had gotten a ticket that they had not told me that they were scared about and that they if they had not uh, paid it their license was going to be suspended or they were going to lose uh their driving privileges sure. so or even uh, uh be arrested so i think it's definitely a good bill and it's not too much to ask for law enforcement and i appreciate you bringing the bill thank you i appreciate yes that. sir thank you sure thanks gentlemen sure recognize the gentleman from clark representative jackson <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I just want to, uh, uh, isn't this a little overreach? I mean, we, we are, to, the police officers are supposed to protect and serve, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, coming against the bill, but I'm going to, we're extending that, 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 that popo arm a little, a little more extensive with your, with your legislation. And this is, a, a, uh, I know parents are supposed to be parents. Children are going to be children. Do you have any? I have three. And they're going to follow rules and regulations that dad set in place. And well, then when they're with their friends, they're going to be what, they're going to be like their friends. See, that, that, I, I, I'm trying to keep our young people from being criminalized for just enjoying themselves. You know, when I was a kid, I'm tell you what, 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 what we did, like rabbit tobacco. You know anything about rabbit tobacco? See, see a few of us, you had them old corn cob pipes. Do you know anything about corn cob pipes? Sure. So, you know, we get together and go and pick, find that little rabbit tobacco. And then some of us uh, find little cigarette butts that have been thrown down and mix that with in the corn cob pipe. And we, we, we try to be like grown ups. So will you explain your bill once again? I mean, I, I mean I, the police officer will see an under, underage kid and do what to him? Sure. So I got a 17 year old daughter. We just we just talked about uh, children. I got a 17 year old daughter. She's driving my car, using my insurance, burning my gas. I'm liable for her. If she gets pulled over, I would never know it. She's got she she could pay the ticket. I would never know it. She could she could get pulled over twice. I would never know it. Your insurance will let you know it. Well, they might. They might. If it's a seatbelt infraction, they might not. And so if my daughter gets pulled over for a seatbelt issue, I want to know about it. Well, see, responsibility come from, from, from you and accountability come from the child. So I don't care. It, it, the police officer is not going to be the one that make them accountable. I'm going to teach her if you, I know about you, it. You're going to make them accountable. I mean, I, see, we're trying, to, we're trying to get people to help raise our children. And we got to learn to trust our children. See, and, and, and we don't trust them, they're going to always be in a situation like that. But I'm, I'm through. I'm, not, I'm just trying to see my parents and your parents is different. I, I raised four. Three, so, three boys and a girl. And I, you know, and that, hang on to a jailhouse to, to get them out. No infractions, the speeding that I got, knowing it. So because I trusted them. Thank you. Chair sure recognizes the gentleman from Morgan, Leader Stahagen. Thank you for your recognition, Mr. Speaker. Um, do you have any kids that drive currently? I do. What's, what's their age? 17. And do they pay their own insurance? They do not. They pay their own vehicle? She does not. Thank you. Thank you. you recognize the gentleman from Jefferson, Representative Sellers. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the gentleman yield? Yes. Uh, thank you for this piece of legis legislation. When my daughters were teenagers, um, matter of fact, two in particular, two different uh, occasions, um, they got stopped. I didn't get the call until ticket was due. And so um, I think this was, will kind of also keep parents informed sure. of activity of their children. So thank you so much. I think it's, thank you. I appreciate it. Question for the body now is the adoption of the BIR. Clerk will unlock the scene to members of vote. <laughs> Clerk will lock the machine, court of votes, 95 eyes, one day, the BR has been adopted. Mr. Speaker, I call for, uh, well, I think there's a sub. Uh, is this a committee sub? Yes, this is a committee I'm sub. Here to explain the committee sub. I'll be glad to. So we added for law enforcement's benefit, the, instead of shall notify, it's to make a reasonable effort. And so law enforcement does not absolutely have to notify, but they must make a reasonable effort. Okay, you've heard the explanation for the committee sub. Clerk will unlock the machine and the members will vote. There may be a type of license, but the statute says anything. Clerk will lock the machine for the votes. Nine eyes, two nays. The sub has been adopted. So, Rich and Kiel. Mr. Speaker, I uh, call final passage as substituted. That is question. Is final passage as substituted? Clerk will unlock the machine and the members will vote. Clerk lock machine, record of those, 96 eyes, three nays, HB 211, has passed as substituted. Representative Kill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to give you a moment for personal privilege. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, this this bill, as a lot of times happens, does have a personal story to it. Uh, a, a young man and young lady uh, were killed in a car accident uh, in in Muscle Shoals in Tuscumbia, and uh, neither of them had their seatbelt on. Uh, what we found out later was is that uh, T.J. Morgan, the young man who was driving, had uh, had infractions before for not wearing his seatbelt. His mom and dad were not notified thought of that they had no idea until after he had passed away and so uh, when I heard that story uh, I talked to uh, his uh, mother who I went to high school with I also went to high school with his dad and so uh, uh, TJ Morgan and Lacey Glass were killed in that wreck and TJ's mother April Vapius is with us today and April if you would stand we'd like to recognize you Thank you very much. And, I, and, and I'm not saying that this is going to save every life that somebody gets a ticket, but as a father, at least I would be able to correct my daughter and, and, and try to discipline her in a way that would, uh, in the future, she would wear her seatbelt if that were to happen to me. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, buddy. Same ribs of kill. Job well done. I'd like to recognize in the gallery uh, leadership Lake Martin from Tallapoosa County, District 81, guest of Representative Ed Oliver and Chief Tuggle. Let's give them a big hand. Thank you all for being with us today. Also from Baldwin County, the Constitution's Office, Cliff McCollum and Allison Morrow. And they're the guests of Representative Givens, Simpson, Hope Jones, Fiddler, Baker, Stringer, and Easterbrook. Let's give them a big and thank you for being with us today. <laughs> Clerk call next bill on special order calendar. On page 10 of the calendar, House Bill number 34 by Representative Hill relating to judicial compensation. Chairman Hill, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, our judges every six years receive uh, an incremental uh, pay increase. We call it a we call it an experience or longevity. Both district, circuit, and also our appellate level bench all receives this. However, if you're a circuit judge or a district judge and you go to the appellate level bench, you do not get to carry that incremental increase with you. 
The purpose of this bill is to allow that incremental increase, that bench experience, to go forward and carry forward with you if you go from being a circuit or a district judge to being an appellate level judge. The, the thrust behind this is try to encourage circuit and district judges who are our trial judges to go on to the appellate level bench because the purpose of the appellate level bench is to oversee that which the trial bench does. Consequently, I would ask for the BIR. Sure, recognize the gentleman from Lauderdale, Representative Pettis. While he's making his way down here, I'd like to recognize a former member of ours, Representative Rod Scott, for being in the chamber today. Rod, good to see you. Good morning, Judge. Good morning, Mr. Pettis. I mean, you've talked about this bill. Uh, you didn't ask me if I was going to yield. Oh, will you yield, I guess? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's right now, it's up in the air. But but I tell you what, I will momentarily. <laughs> I mean, you know, we talked about compensation. You know, I, the past two years, I've had a bill to uh, add compensation to the troopers for Alabama. And I keep getting told it don't need to be legislated. And that's what I keep bringing up. And then there's three bills on the calendar today to raise compensation legislatively. So I guess my question is, which is legislative and which is not? I can't answer that. I'm, that's way above my pay grade. The purpose of this bill, though, Philip, is, is to encourage trial judges to go to the appellate level bitch. Uh, yes, you and I have had this conversation. Shucks, we stay in the same trailer park out there, yes, you know? And as I have told you, and I continue to tell you, I am 100% in favor of raising compensation for our first responders because it's crucial. So, I agree. And so I'm, we are I think not on opposite ends of that stick. Yeah, I think this, you know, everybody, I think we're trying to help all these make better officers, better judges, and have better judges up there. And the same thing I'm trying to do with the troopers. Gotcha. But I appreciate you bringing this bill. I'm good with it. Thanks. But One I, of the things that really does bother me, we've got 19 appellate level bench mm -hmm. judges, judges and justices, two of them came off the trial bench. I just think it'd be, I think we would be better served in this state. The experience makes a difference. To encourage others that have that trial level experience to get on the appellate level bench. That's that's it in a nutshell. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arms. Sure, thanks, General. Question for the body now is the adoption of the BIR. Clerk will lock and sheen the members vote. <laughs> All right, looks like it passes 100 yeas, three abstention, no nays. <laughs> Do what? Miss Clark, you can lock the machine now. <laughs> 100 eyes, zero nays, and the BR has passed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is I think we need to call this bill over at this time. And I appreciate that, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and I will take that in the uh, spirit of love and, and, and concern uh, that you offer it. However, I would ask for final passage. <laughs> that is the question is final passage of HB 34. Clerk will unlock the machine and the members vote. Oh, Clerk Lock Sheen, Court of Votes, 100 ayes, 0 nays, 3 abstentions, HB 34 has passed. Listen, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate it. And ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate it. I hope, I hope that we are able to encourage this because I hope we can get more people with experience on the appellate level bench, and that's what I want. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Clerk, clerk call the next bill. On page 21 of the calendar, House Bill number 255 with substitute by Representative Bedsoll relating to sheriffs. Representative Bedsoll, you're recognized. Thank you. HB 255 is a civil of process fee bill. This will allow the sheriffs of our counties to have a $50 fee assessed to any civil process service, uh, civil or criminal and juvenile cases in their county. 
The $50 will, uh, bulk of it will go to our sheriffs, $42 for them. Clerks will be able to keep $5 of that and $3 to the district attorney. This applies only to a party in a civil, criminal, or juvenile case, and other types of service are requested, uh, such as certified mail, there is no fee, or if the individual filing the case, they may choose to use a process server. So with that being said, Mr. Speaker, I would ask for the BIR. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Dale, Representative Klaus. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Bedsold, now, this is, uh, you say, allowing. So in other words, the, they would have to, each county would have to come with a local bill at that point, whether or not their sheriffs would want to, or just mandate that they just automatically do it, or what? Yeah, good, good question. Probably, I, I should say, a lot of counties, uh, there are actually, um, 18 to 20 counties that already have local acts in place, that they had a local bill passed that allowed them to have a fee added on for this same process. This is a statewide bill that would uh, go into effect and there's specific language here that the sheriff of that county, if they already have a local bill, they'll have to choose, do they want to fall under the new statewide bill or do they simply stay with the local bill they already have? So this, the answer I think that to your question is that once this goes into effect, the sheriff in that county would either stay with his local bill or then fall under the statewide act. So, so in other words, it, it would automatically go into effect for everybody. So they would, they would, they would have to do this. They don't, they don't have to, if they, if they have a local act, they can choose to keep their local well, if they act. they don't have a local have, act right now, so your county didn't have a local act, that's right. they would, then they, they would automatically be putting that fee on then. This would be there. For anything that is requested that the sheriff serves, if they choose to use process server, or if they do certified mail in like district cases, $20,000 and less, those, those can be done by certified mail. Okay, so, so th this would put a fee on then on October 1st? Uh, yes, sir, whenever the effective date, November 1st of 2024, I believe, or maybe it's October, so 30 days after that, they have to declare which one they're gonna use, so October 1. So so is this coming about because of the, the sheriffs or in the counties are not getting the revenue they thought that, that they used to get because of a particular bill we passed? We we're con certainly continue to unravel history here, um, and when the decision was made to eliminate the concealed weapons permits, we're, we're seeing what the long-term effect is. I, estimates are 70, 80 percent less revenue. And, and what we have to keep in mind is the history here, the, the revenue that came in from the sale of the pistol permits, it was intentional that our sheriffs in our state were the ones who sold that. And it was for a very specific reason, because counties can't raise their own revenue. This was a way to assist counties to fund their sheriff. And those funds have to be used for law enforcement purposes. Uh, things our, our sheriffs are purchasing are things like vehicles and equipment, ammo, bulletproof vests, training, things of that nature. So to answer your question kind of lonely, you're absolutely correct. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Sure, thanks, gentlemen. Sure, recognize the gentleman from Clark, Representative Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was asked if I was going to be here long, win it today. But when you bring bills like this to, to hurt constituents, it ain't nothing but a tax. You're raising taxes on people that need help the most. You're hurting the most. And I see even your substitute that says about uh, 50, $50 per case for filing. You know, I, we can't legislate our way out of this thing, Mr. Bitsos, and uh, you've been an enforcement officer knowing what people go through, knowing that they're in need of, of, of assistance, and this is not one way that we are lifting them. We are adding a, a burden. We're suppressing them even more with this type legislation. So we came in with a smart idea 
to take away the pistol permit. That was the funding mechanism for county sheriffs, mostly throughout rural Alabama. But we, had, we were so intelligent until we thought we'd do away with because the ERA thought it would, thought it would be, 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 be for them so everybody walk around with a gun and don't have it registered, no permit. So I'm just, I, I'm really at Paul of, of, of you coming back, which added more additional to the citizens of this state. So I, I'm not going to go through the detail. I could talk 10 minutes on it, but I'm not going to do it. But I, I just want the people to understand this. A fee, this is a, this is a tax in, in any other name. It was a tax. And I thought we were supposed to be friendly when it comes to supporting our people. We, we, we should be taxing them more. A rose by any other name is a rose. And this is a rose with a tax attached to it. So I just wanted to let the people know my share probably wants it because they lost revenue when you took away the pistol permit. And but I'm I'm against it. Thank you so much. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Winston, Representative Wadsworth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the gentleman yield? Yes, sir. Um, I agree with uh, Representative Jackson that this is just a, another tax that we're putting on the, the people. And one thing, this does this apply, add $50 to small claims cases? So as it's spelled out, and I want to make sure I give it, because you certainly know the system better than I do. So this would be all civil, criminal, and juvenile cases for so the request. It, it covers all, it, every small claims that, that is owed, owed to anybody for adding $50 fee on top of that. Only, only where the request of the sheriff to do the service. Which is most of the time, correct? I, I don't have those numbers. I mean, I, I would assume certified mail and process well, servers are used quite a bit. Well, I mean, the, the duty of a sheriff is uh, to serve, and that's in the Constitution and in, in the statute. You. And if they have that duty to serve, we're actually adding this on top of it, of that fee, correct? And that, that small claims, that's district yeah. court, that's that's circuit court, it's, it's, it's all cases. Now, this doesn't add any any additional requirement on the sheriff to do what, what their prior duty was, does it? Uh, not specifically spelled out. Yeah. And there's no requirement that they serve within a certain time period because yeah. most of the time what what happens, or at least a lot of the times, uh, what you have is you have a somebody to be served, they're not served, and then you have to go file a special, uh, you go file and hire a special process server and pay another $100 to get them served. And if they're not served within 90 days, the case is generally dismissed, and then you got to come back and pay another filing fee, another process server fee of $50 on top of that. And, you know, people that, that are behind in rent get behind in rent, and a landlord needs to have them removed from the property. Well, they have to pay this additional $50 on top of it. And, you know, one of the problems we're running in, like in Alabama, we can pay up to $1,000 in to, to file cases in Alabama, while in Mississippi it's roughly about $150, which is a, it was a big difference. And, and we're basically making it where landlords uh, and individuals can't go get their get their justice and get and get people out. And that's the pro problem is I just don't think we ought to be taxing people more and more and more 
from this this point forward. At some point, we've got to be able to, you know, we, we complain about the uh, uh, about the fees and inflation and what we all have, but and but then again, we're not doing our duty by trying to keep fees lower on here, because if the sheriff's association wanted to have additional fees, they could have gone through the legislature and made a request. Do you know if they went through the legislature and made a request for one of the budgets for, the, for them to be covered by this? Well, there is one already in which there's that funding that uh, we've passed a bill. We've I, been I can't hear you. I'm sorry. <laughs> So, as you well know, we've been before this body twice with the, what well, I think it's called maybe the pistol permit, re pistol permit re uh, reimbursement fund. Um, but I, I think, you know, as I talk to other members, the general sentiment is that we can't continue to fund that through the general fund. I think we, the, the direction has been that the counties, we need to find a way to take care of that through other means. Well, so. you know, we, when the pistol permit pays, that saves taxpayers money. Uh, by, by not having to do that fee. But we also passed a bill that allows sheriffs to make a request to get reimbursed the money that they lost in that. Is that correct? That's what I was just speaking about. Yeah. And that's going to sunset in, uh, I believe, 2029. Okay, it sunsets in 2029. So for the next basically five more years, we're going to add a fee of $50 on top of what they're getting in always what they're getting right now anyway so I, I wish that that fund really was able to make all the sheriffs hold to where they are like the spirit and intent of the bill but my point my point is that's they're getting that reimbursement that fee for the pistol permit they're not losing anything with the pistol permit fee because what they're doing is they're getting reimbursed through uh, another mechanism that we set up for them to be reimbursed so all the all the discussion that that has been done that this replaces the pistol permit fee is not is not correct is it? well so there's not an unlimited amount of money in that fund so uh, estimates are that the sheriffs still are about six million dollars in the red and so they're not getting reimbursed I, I haven't seen those numbers but they get reimbursed through 2029 uh, the, the mechanism is in place right now for them to be reimbursed to uh, 2029 and what we're doing is we're now adding another $50 fee on top of, of what they were getting and, and being reimbursed. Yeah. And, and I, that concerns me because, you know, we're, we're, we're imposing taxes, we're adding more of these fees, and there's everything we do down here seems to be that we just want to add more fees and inflation. We already got inflation, now we're adding more fees. And then the cost of housing is going up up. And then when landlords want to get their uh, get their property back because the the uh, tenant is not paying, well then we're back to the point again of having to uh, pay more fees on it. And but 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 they're not. They've got to be able to get them served quickly, and they're not doing it most of the time. I, I you know, think it's, area, a, you, it's you a pretty general statement. You know, I, you know this. You and I talked. I, I have yeah. personal experience. The the papers in, in the area in which I serve. We're, we're getting them served sometimes you can't serve individuals. They don't want to be served. And so even though you have the best effort, it's hard to get them that's, served. That, that's really not what this bill's about. This bill is about adding taxes and cost and fees to this, to this, to, and it's not just, it's not just to anybody. It, it is to every citizen that has to file a small claims case, every citizen that has to file an unlawful detainer, every civil case, and there are times that we're there that uh, to get justice, you've got to pay up to a thousand dollars on some cases, while other states like Mississippi is $150, and, and that's what my concern is because we're all we're doing is we're, we're not doing anything to put any additional requirement for them to serve within a certain period of time. And if you file this case and then you don't serve them within 90 days, then the court generally will dismiss that case. And and then that person has to then go back and pay another filing fee and another special process service fee on top of that. 
And, and that's why I'm, I'm opposed to it, because I think we're just adding costs and making where we can't get justice out there anymore. But, uh, but you know, we, we've discussed, you know, you know, I, at some point I'm going to introduce a bill, uh, introduce an amendment that would say they have to serve within 30 days or they don't receive the, that fee. But at this point, I'm not introducing it, but a little bit later I am. And I'd, I'd like for you to con at least consider that because I mean you talked about that. Yes. Because what we want is we uh, people want to be things to be served, but they also and if they pay a fee, they want to get something in exchange for that. But uh, I appreciate your time. Thank yes, you. Sir. Thank you. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Chair, recognize the lady from Madison, Representative Hall. Be the fourth person to speak on the BR. While she's making her way down here, I'd like to introduce leadership at Etowah from Etowah County, the guest of Representative Butler, Lipscomb, and Gidley. Let's give them a big hand. Thank you all for being with us today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the gentleman yield? Yes, ma'am. I want to say I did all the comments that came from Representative Ainsworth. I'm always challenged at the method by which we collect fees. Can you, what would help me to understand what would cause papers not to be served? <laughs> Uh, as you're going through this process. What are the types of things that cause that to happen? I think maybe a conversation with your sheriff, you know, to know in your area, it's hard to know exactly what the challenges would be, but, you know, I can speak from the sheriff's office in which I serve. Every paper that is sent to us from the court, uh, we make attempts, multiple attempts, to serve individuals, and sometimes through our best efforts you can't serve some individuals they don't want to be served they avoid service um, it's not a matter of our resources not being able to serve it we will make attempts on every single paper uh, but i can't speak to every county but so but what is it true based on the comments from representative ainsworth that if you go to serve somebody that fee is assessed if you that if that individual is not available and they have to be served again. Is that an uh, that additional fee assessed? It did it. It didn't indicate that only one time a fee is assessed. So, if it was me and I was filing and I chose the sheriff's office as the mechanism to do it, that's a fifty dollar filing fee. It's not per document, but there's a one time filing fee. And if what he was saying is correct. Me, I would not choose that option again. The next time I tried to serve an individual, I would not pay that $50. I would try another method. For example, certified mail. There's no $50 fee if you as the, the filing attorney decide to file it through and use certified mail, there is no $50 fee. If you choose to use a process server because that's their job and they're dedicated, then you would simply pay your fee to the process server. But these, those options are not indicated in this bill. That's because this bill only pertains if you file and you choose to use the sheriff, then the $50 fee applies. If you choose to do certified mail, if you choose to use a process server, you simply just don't pay the fee. Is it your feeling or your knowledge, to your knowledge, that most counties use the sheriff versus the mailing? I would say traditionally that is correct. We passed a local bill last year for Shelby County, and after the passage of the local bill, those numbers of papers in which we were requested to serve has actually declined. So it is, it is uh, they're using other methods to do so. They're using certified mail, they're using process servers. I don't exactly know why they declined. It could be the fee, it could be that um, with the demand, maybe they're, they're seeing that they can get better traction by going to a process server, but um, but actually we, we what kind of serve? What kind of server? A process server, so these are, they. They, they, they are in the business to take your paper. They know the court system. They go and they do the service. It's um, it's just a, another profession, if you will. Hmm. I, I, I do, um, I certainly do agree with the comments that were made earlier. And so if, if obviously 
we are trying to take care of a problem. Now I thought, now I'm on, the, I'm, I serve on Ways and Means, and I thought we passed a bill, I mean, we, that's in the budget. We provided funds to supplement what the, um, We did. Okay. So, so that bill, and I, I had, I had that bill last year, I think it was last year, we, we had a kind of a revision, but we have only a certain pot of money that's available there, so that the, the reimbursement is not fully reimbursing all sheriffs. Um, I think I had the uh, figures it was somewhere around six million dollars in the red so we have sheriffs across our state that are applying for the lost revenue related to that bill but they're not getting reimbursed because there's not there's not enough money there also that does sunset oh, just so you're saying the money the amount that was allocated with from the bill that you had does not provide enough funding for them to make up the difference. For the lost revenue, that's right. Because oh. they have to show that lost revenue. There's a comparison, they go back and compare, and anything that's off of that comparison, that's what they can apply for. And so it, it, with Madison County, um, about 800,000 to a million dollars a year in loss from the lost revenue. So why you all won't go back to the pistol permit then? Why don't why, we go Why won't you go back to it? Why don't you repeal the bill? I didn't support the original bill to get rid of it, so uh, this was a problem that wasn't created by you, or, you or I, for sure. No, I can tell you, I didn't help create it. I, it, it yeah. No, but I, I mean, I think if that is serious, it's certainly, and I think that those comments were made many times that you're losing. I mean, many, and you may be, may have been one of them, that the amount of revenue that you would lose, but that at least it was personal. Those individuals wanted that particular instrument, wanted the pistol or the gun, and they were willing to pay for it. So my recommendation: let's repeal that permit bill. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. That's fourth person on the BR. Clerk on the lock machine. The members of vote. <laughs> Clerk on the lock machines. Record the votes. 52 ayes, 25 nays. You add me to that, please. BR has passed. Reverend Betso. Yes, Mr. Speaker, we had uh, some uh, amendments in committee, so I do have a sub. Okay. You care to explain your sub? Yes, sir. Um, we wanted to ensure that we had some of the language uh, correct here that would uh, clarify. For example, one of the biggest pieces is the original bill. So if there was documents going to multiple uh, parties in the case, every document would be charged this fee. So we actually change it to a per case fee. So it's a that one time fee again, $50. If you choose to use the sheriff, it's just the one time per case fee. Uh, and that's a part of the sub. We also ensured the language that the, the collection of the civil service process fee at the time of the filing, so that is done on the front end when it's filed. We changed the dist distribution. The uh, fee shows now that the clerks get $5 uh, rather than three in the original bill, so our, our court clerks are getting a little bit more of that $50. It spells out also that any case filed in another state, the sheriff may also request that fee. It's filed in another state, but served in their county. And then also further provides to make sure that the sheriffs choose between their local act or this statewide act. And it must be done by November 1st, 2024, which is 30 days after this would be enacted. Sure, recognize is the gentleman from St. Clair, Chairman Hill. He didn't want to speak on the sub. He didn't want to speak on the sub, he said. Okay, all right, thanks, sir. Representative Chestnut, you want to speak on this?
committee amendment? Or do you want to speak on the bill? Okay. Uh, the question for the body now is the adoption of the committee sub. Clerk on lock machine, the members vote. <laughs> Clerk Lock Machine Court votes 65 days, 24 days. Committee sub has been adopted. Yes, sir, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure there's a few questions. Okay. Chair recognizes the uh, lady from Chambers, Representative Wood. Thank you for the recognition, Mr. Speaker. Will you yield? Yes, ma'am. Well, the biggest concern I have is this is revenue for the sheriff, and I have not heard from my sheriff. And I'm talking to my colleagues around me, and their sheriffs are not calling them. So if it's revenue for the sheriff, because if we cut revenue for the sheriff, they definitely call us. But if it's a bill to generate revenue and they're for it, they generally pick up the phone, call us, or come see us. So that's my concern with your bill. Yeah. Why you haven't heard from them? And, and most of my colleagues that I've talked to have not heard from their sheriffs wanting this bill. I assume you'd have to speak with your sheriff and ask them why. This is a bill that's coming from the Sheriff's Association. So perhaps they feel like that since the association is working it and bringing it, that that's covered, but you'll have to speak to your sheriff about that. Well, I'm sitting with a lot of people up there and I'm asking them and none of us have heard. So that's just kind of astounding to me because if it's revenue and they're hurting for revenue, typically they pick up the phone and call us. So that's really making me question the bill. I, I think your heart is good, but yeah. I'm just worried because I haven't heard from my sheriff. It's coming from the Sheriff's Association, so that's about I the, haven't uh, heard from them either. Yeah, well, so. turn around and wave right up there, <laughs> right up there. Yeah. Um, and so at the end of the day, uh, this was something that was brought forth uh, representing all 67 sheriffs on behalf of the association. And, um, you know, that's that's about the best I can tell you. I haven't spoken with your sheriff either, but that's mm -hmm. not unusual. So thank you. Chair, thanks a lady. Chair recognize the gentleman from Madison. Representative Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the gentleman yield? Yes, sir. Uh, Representative Bedsoe, uh, I appreciate you bringing this bill. I, I have heard from my sheriff loud and clear. Uh, we do have a local ordinance that sets our, our fees, uh, but if this legislation passes, he will absolutely amend to this legislation, obviously due to uh, cost of fuel, cost of vehicle usage, uh, our rising cost of our personnel, and those fees were in many, in many cases were set many years ago. So I think this kind of brings it up, you know, with right. with the cost of living that we've got, and uh, he certainly is supportive of the bill. Mr. Chairman, as you well know, you know, in, in the counties that have no local legislation to add a fee, the sheriff, although I know constitutionally there, there spells out for them to perform this duty, they've been doing this at no cost. They have been uh, the arm of the court to serve these papers, and as you well mentioned, the rising cost of fuel, vehicles, and personnel. Um, the sheriffs can't continue to do that. And so I, I think this this was a very viable option because I know the, the, the tax word has been thrown around, but there is a service that is being provided here by the sheriffs. And I think it's a, a very small ask here to do that. So I appreciate your comments. It is, and you brought up a good point that, that in many times in legal proceedings that there are, are private servers uh, that can do those civil paperwork. But even in that case, uh, there is a fee assessed to maybe an attorney or a family uh, but that, that is, you know, just the cost of doing business. A absolutely. And if you if you bring in a process server, you're probably going to pay more than fifty dollars. Um, and, and so that cost is going to be even more. Your other option is certified mail, which is a minimal cost. But as you well know, it may get sent, but never be able to deliver to the individual. So um, the fifty dollar fee to what the sheriff has to do to provide the manpower and have someone go out and, and serve that. Um, and, and then also too, your clerks are getting a small part of this. They're the ones processing this paperwork. So uh, unfortunately, there is a cost to doing business when you're in the court system. We don't want to make it prohibited, but at the same time, there's a cost to doing business here. Right. You know, with, with the growth that we're seeing in Madison County, it's really overwhelming his his resources uh, and certainly this will relieve some of that pressure. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. 
chair recognizes this a gentleman from Dallas, Representative Chestnut. Does the gentleman yield? Yes, sir. Um, one question I have to you is, who, who all is exempt from filing this? We're having to pay this $50. Well, if you choose not to use the sheriff as the way that papers or that process is served, then I guess technically everybody would be if they didn't want to use the sheriff to serve it. Okay. Um, but doesn't the sheriff already serve process now as just a matter of like isn't that fee already included in what we pay when we file a claim in the first place perhaps it is but the sheriff isn't getting any fees associated unless there's a local bill for them to do so already in place but the sheriff is doing it but not necessarily it, it might be into court cost but the sheriff is not receiving any of the fees so let me give you a scenario a lady walks into david faulkner's law office and she says david uh i had this guy to do some work at my house and um I paid him $300 and he did not do what he was supposed to do. And I wanna know what I can do about it. And she wants to file a small claim. Now let's just say that the small claim charge is $100 and where she lives. Is that your charge? No, the small claim, like you, when you file it, you have to pay. Okay. Let's say it's $100 for at that particular courthouse then you add an extra $50 on it, what's gonna be, this is going to deter small claims across the board. People are gonna make a decision that, well, for the extra $50, you know what, maybe I'll just take this loss and uh, they can't go through the criminal route because it's a civil matter. And so, you're essentially creating a denial of access to the courts. And that is a serious concern that I have about this bill. Is there, is there, any, is there any way that a person who, who comes in poor, and they, they have this thing called impopera, right? Poor, a poor person uh, who's filing it on their own behalf pro se, uh, sometimes they will, the filing fees can be waived. Well, but this here, I didn't see anything in this bill that would allow a waiver of this $50 fee if you have a person who can't legitimately afford it. Yep. It's my understanding it can't, this can be waived. The judge can waive this fee as well. Uh, I understand you didn't specifically see it and, and, and if that's something you would like to add in so it's crystal clear, that would be no problem. But it is my understanding the judge can waive this fee. Okay, I would definitely want to, because you know, if you're a strict constructionist judge, you're not gonna waive it. Now, if, you, if you're if you elastic, you believe that you can bend the law the way you want it, then that's what's gonna happen. You know, sure. judges, like if I was sitting and I, I wouldn't do it because I would not see where I had the, because legislative, what the legislature puts together, it's a, you're the, we're the lawmaking body. Judges are interpreters of the law. And where there's vagueness or openness, then we would supply what we feel is the answer. Uh, but, you know, so yeah, I, I would definitely be wanting to possibly bring something sure. to deal with that, okay? Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, the well, really other other question I would have for you is that uh, housing authorities, um, as well as realtors. So let's say that there's a, there's someone that owns eight homes, and um, and two of those homes, they have issues with people not necessarily paying always on time and they want to evict. Well, are these realtors are gonna 
they're going to have to pay $50 extra every time they want to evict someone? And will the housing authority have to pay $50 extra every time they want to evict someone? If they choose to use the sheriff as the mechanism to serve the process, then then they would. Okay, okay. Well, it's... it's uh, okay, I understood, I understood. But I will, on, on the... On the folks who are who are poor and can't afford it, I will try to see if I can work something and bring it back up here, and hopefully it'll be to your to your uh, for your appetite. Yeah, I will say the Realtors Association was was worked with to address their concerns. They have not told me they they object to this bill at all. I, I'm not saying they're for it, but I'm certainly saying that they were worked with during this process. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good to know, at least. Okay. What? Uh, okay. Great. All right. Yeah. I don't think I have anything else to ask you, but I'll be back up okay. at some point. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Mobile, Representative Jones. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the recognition. Gentleman Yale. Yes, sir. Uh, Representative Bitts, so you, uh, you work with the Sheriff's Department. Are you still? Yes, sir. Okay. So I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the budget process for the Sheriff's Department when they go to the County Commission? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, it might have changed since I've been there. <laughs> but when I was there, a part of the budget is those cars you talked about. The gasoline you talked about, the pay for the deputies you're talking about, and the complete operation of the sheriff's department. Is that not correct? It's in the budget, but I will give you a personal example. And this is your time. I don't want to take your time, but but those revenues aren't always suitable to meet the needs. Um, in our county, anywhere from three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars each year our sheriff uses his discretionary money to partner with the county so that our fleet can be made whole we have a certain number of vehicles that we have to replace each year and so he uses that money to help partner with the county so i, I can and, and there's other examples across the state i'm sure he's not the only one to use those funds for that yeah, but that's not a part of the budget process is it Ahead of time. Long, as long as I've been there, I had not seen yeah. any money from the Pittsburgh Bit Fund in the budget. Well, again, I, you know, I'd be happy to, to let you come see how we do it in, in Shelby, but that is a uh, before the budget process, so, he commits his money to partner with them. So it's, it's a great partnership. In, in essence, it helps them raise their revenue because they can take that money he gives them to buy vehicles and they can use... That, their share of our uh, in other areas, so it actually well, increases it. Maybe we ought to establish for us who's ultimately responsible by the law to fund the share. Yes, the, the county commission is. Okay. All right. Now, um, the reason I'm asking these questions, I, I understand just what you're saying. And I think as a result of the Pittsburgh Remit Fund, there has been a reduction in available revenue for the sheriff's department. The only problem I have with that is the people that are really having to pay these fees, most people who, who got the money, they hire a private process server. Yes, and you know why they hire one? Because they want it served. <laughs> and, and the other thing about it is, I don't see any accountability in it. If I pay $50 and it doesn't get served, then what? Yeah. I think you have a complaint to the sheriff is what you have, right? So I think it does. It puts it does put a little bit more on our sheriffs and the deputies that if you're getting paid for this, well, you better make very, very, very good effort to serve those papers. Well, a year, a few years back, and I'll count, I'm sure you've heard about this, that um, we had a deputy that was prosecuted because of that, because there were several hundred in the trunk of the car. Yep. And, and, you know, all, all I'm saying about that is that if nothing else, it should be some accountability that is actually going to be served if somebody's paying $50 extra, actually, which is extra for it, because they're paying court fees, they're paying all. And doing all that, uh, I, I just heard you say that you didn't vote to get rid of the pills from their fund. Yes, I didn't either. And... Uh, I don't know if that helped us or hurt us, not just in terms of, of revenue,
but also in terms of uh, whether we get more gun crimes or less. I, I don't have statistics on all that, so I won't get into that discussion. <laughs> But my point is that $50 is a lot of money to some yes, people, and I know you understand that. Yeah. But when we have those folk come and, and they've been taken advantage of by someone, they don't have anywhere to go but small claims court. And what they wound up doing, by the time they get through paying court fees and paying process costs, they spent more than they can possibly get back on a lot of these claims that they have. Yeah. So my concern is the burden that we put on citizens as it relates to that. Um, my recommendation to you is that uh, see if you can get the county commission to give you some process <laughs> money when you when you go and do the budget. I have a question real quick. If you pay a process server and they don't serve your paper, it, do you get your money back? Well, the, the, I don't know because yeah, I, I, don't know I, I, never, I never had to do that. Uh, I was just wanted the accountability we were talking about. I was curious to know if a process server has to give your money back if they don't serve your paper. Well, there's some, I'm a landlord, there's some landlords who do their own service. So. But I, I, I really think that we should pay some attention to the burden that it brings on the people who, by the way, pays the budget from the beginning, yeah, that's who right. actually contribute to the budget from the beginning. And I, I would just hope that we could find some way to enhance the money that was lost from the pills for med fund without putting all that burden yes sir i agree on, on citizens that that that's that's my point about it i uh, i really think that and i i just had another we had another bill come to admit the other day that's going to allow the sheriff or, or sanction the sheriff for raising their own money that, that, which is good i don't have a problem with that but i do have a problem with us continuously putting the burden Sure. No citizen to just get justice. Yep. That's Very fair. So that, that Very fair point. That's my point. Right. Thank you. Chair, thanks to gentleman. Chair recognize the general from St. Clair. Chairman Hill. Hi. Long time no see, Mr. Yes, Bessel. How you doing? I'm well. How are you? Great. Uh, I got a couple of things. I, I've got an amendment to offer, and I'll get it to it in a second. But <clears throat> would you agree with me that this type of legislation would normally be classified just by the ordinary person in our society <clears throat> as court cost? I think that uh, you're correct. Most people would just call this court cost. And of this bill, how much of it actually goes to AOC? Uh, none to AOC. None to AOC. And AOC is the entity that is responsible for courts in this state, the administrative office of courts. <clears throat> so we're passing a bill here, none of which goes to the administrative office of courts, yet it would commonly be referred to <clears throat> as court costs. So I guess I got a couple of problems. You know, interesting, when I came in here, 10 years ago, one of the members of this body said, the problem we've got in this state is our court costs are too high and y'all are killing us. My comment to that was, you won't find a lawyer in this state that's not 100% in favor of doing away with court costs. However, the problem that you have is that most of the things that we commonly referred to as court cost, in fact, are not court cost at all. They are fees that are generated to do things like head injury, forensic science, sheriff, uh, American heritage, on and on and on and on we call court cost. They're not court cost. Now, would you further agree with me that part of the reason that, that this, that you're built, is the fact that the sheriffs in our state have lost a great deal of money because we did away with the permit fees. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. We wouldn't be here having this conversation about this additional fee if it wasn't to try to fix a problem that neither you or I created. Because I guarantee you, I voted against doing away with permits. I think we ought to have pistol permits. I'm gonna tell you a great story in a while I got a minute. I'm going through the airport one time, and you know, you go through the airport, you go through all this security stuff, right? So I'm going through the airport, and I'm waiting in my line, just like everybody else is, and there's some guy up there ahead of me fussing at the, at the security people about why do I have to go through this? Why do I have to do this? I shouldn't have to do this. I don't want to do this. 
And I'm about three or four back from him, and I said, hey, y'all check him real close because I don't understand why anybody that's not doing something wrong is going to mind going through airport security. Same reason is I don't know, understand why anybody that's not got something to hide would mind going and getting a pistol permit that's a pretty cheap thing to get. Don't you agree? Yes, okay. sir. I do. I'm not fussing at you too bad. I know you're not. All right. I feel like you were leading the witness a minute ago, though. I was. <laughs> I got you. I, I, until I get objected to, I do. Here you go. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I do have an amendment. Clerk, see the amendment. Amendment to House Bill number 255 by Representative Hill. Representative Hill. Sir, may I explain the amendment? Yes. Okay. Mr. Betzel, what this does is this, this amendment does nothing except to put a sunset of five years on this particular act. Uh, and, and this collection of this money. I just, I think at some point we ought to look at this. I think we ought to see what we're doing. I don't think we fund sheriffs right in this county state. I don't think we fund DAs right in this state. I think that ought to come out of our general budget. Uh, they are both, they are both uh, entities of the executive branch of government. And, and I think we ought to fund them as such. But I want to sunset your bill. That's my amendment, Mr. Speaker, and I would ask. Heard the explanation of the amendment. What's the sponsor's request? Yes, sir. Um, I would respectfully ask we lay it on the table, and I'll tell you why. You know, I had this discussion. Currently, the pistol permit replacement fund has a sunset on it. And I specifically remember during those conversations when I had that bill where well, there were numerous comments, just the opposite, that the comments were, we have to quit trying to supplement this out of the general fund budget. And so I believe the appetite is not to do that in the general fund budget. And this was a solution to try to eventually get us out of the general fund budget so we don't have to continue doing that. So if we sunset this and sunset that, then we're left with maybe a good conversation, but the sheriffs are in the same problem they are. So that's why I would respect. I got you. And my only thought process back to you is it's a, it's a, it's a farce. Both of these are a farce. We are, we are adding a, a nothing in the world, but a methodology by which we, we give the sheriffs much needed money. I got you much needed money, but we're not doing it honestly. We're doing it in a manner that is, that is almost a subterfuge. Anyway, Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm gonna ask people to allow this amendment. So I guess what lay it on the table, you would vote yes. Well, he is, he is asked that he does not want to accept the amendment. So if you want to lay, he wants to lay it on the table. So if you want to lay it on the table, your vote would be aye. Is that what if you do he's not, your vote would be no. What is he asking for, Mr. Speaker? Is he, he's asking to table it. He's asking table to table it. it. So what the, the vote would be, if you want to table it, your vote's aye. If you want well, I would ask that you vote no. Okay. I got good. you, Mr. Speaker. Right. Whoever's punching my machine, please vote no. Right. Clerk, unlock machine. The members will vote. <laughs> That's a lot of red, isn't it? Clark Lock Machine, record the votes. 12 eyes, 81 no's. The amendment has been adopted. Thank you, Mr. It Bell. felt more warm in here with all that red on the board, didn't it? Well, it's like a nice glowing fire. <laughs> we got a lot of Alabama fans in this body. <laughs> Okay, the question now is to adopt the amendment. So if your vote to adopt the amendment, your vote will be aye. If not, your vote will be no. Clerk on the lock machine, the members of the vote. I guess it's still <laughs> Clerk lock machine, record the votes. 88 ayes, 5 noes. The amendment has been adopted. Representative Betso. Yes, sir. Thank you. Call for final passage. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Mobile, Representative Stringer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the gentleman yield? Yes, sir. 
as you know, I co-sponsored the bill and, you know, I support our sheriffs and want to do what we can do to help. But, but sitting up there listening to all the comments about the pistol permit, I'm not going to sit there and take that. I mean, it's never been the responsibility of the law-abiding gun owners to support the sheriffs. It's not even the responsibility of the state to support the sheriffs. The sheriffs want to talk about the, if anybody says that there's been over 70% a drop in pistol permits, it's false. That is absolutely no, not way. We have, out of 29 states that have passed Constitution carry, we are the only state that put in a grant to fund our sheriffs to help support that. They sit here and say they're short, but yet all the money that's in that grant is still not depleted. So they're not, why are they not applying for that? So my thing is there's, the budget, part of the duties of serving papers is part of the duties of the Sheriff's Department. They get a budget every year to cover that, to cover serving the papers and doing that. They also have narco uh, narcotic seizure funds and other stuff to help support buying cars and other equipment. So I, I wasn't gonna say anything, but the longer I sit here and listen to the other stuff, trying to blame the pistol permit is, is not correct. That is totally false. The fact is, you know, our sheriffs, we need to take care of them and fund them, but it's not the state's responsibility, it's the county's from the get-go. And our, our 29 other states that have this, I've talking to sheriffs in just about every state, and they are surviving. They are still providing services, protecting our communities, and nothing has changed. So to sit here and say that this is because of the permit bill is false. To sit here and say that they don't have cars, equipment, training, and others is false. Um, you know, we have, the Sheriff's Department has responsibilities and duties. It would be like, so I guess next we're gonna say that if a, a deputy responds to your domestic or your burglary, that we're gonna charge a $150 processing fee or handling fee. I mean, I wasn't gonna say anything, but I am not gonna sit here and let everybody say or think because of a few that this is because of the uh, pistol permit bill. The pistol permit bill has not affected the sheriffs this, this dramatically. I'd be happy to respond and, and you can. I respectfully disagree. Uh, as you well know, still active. I, it, it has affected. Percent. I can speci specifically speak that between 70 and 80 percent has dropped. Absolutely not. And the sheriffs and, and the sheriffs association should have more integrity than anybody in our state. And, and I would love, and if they want to prove me wrong, I would love to see the numbers. Yeah, I, again, I can provide you very specifically with one agency in which it has occurred. And so I, I don't think it's a farce. I don't think it's inaccurate. I don't think it's, it's off. Nor did anyone say that we don't have cars, we don't have training, and we don't ha have, as you well know, those funds are used so we can maintain and continue to do those things. So if we want our sheriffs to be able to serve their constituents in the same way, much like if you and I, we get community grant funds so we can serve our constituents. Mm -hmm. With, without those things, we can't go into the schools and help our schools and libraries and other educational pieces. Without that, the sheriffs can't continue to do these things. Nobody's saying the, the well is dry, but we've been asked to come up with a solution. So, um, you know, going back to that bill a few years ago, I did some research because I wanted to wrap my mind around and understand why in the world do the sheriffs of our state sell pistol permits? Because you go to other states and it's state law enforcement. It's, the, it's a state government entity. And so I, I found some old records that explained it, and it specifically laid out because the legislature and the governor at the time fully recognized that counties cannot raise their own revenue. And nobody wants to talk about raising property tax, that's for sure, right? They can't raise their own revenue. So how was the best way to supplement that? Was for them to allow the sheriffs of every 
every county to sell pistol permit. This wasn't set up to be a slush fund for the sheriff. What it was is a way to help the county help themselves because that process isn't clear. So you really have to get a picture that goes back maybe 50 or 60 years ago, well before our time, to understand why was the sheriff even selling pistol permits. And not one of the 67 sheriffs that are serving today were here when that happened 60 years ago or more. So they inherited a system and they got elected by their people and as accountable to their people as you and I are. And in some ways, they're the representative in their county just like we are in our district. True. Yet their funding is completely relying on the county commission. So that, that extra revenue that, by the way, has to be spent for law enforcement purposes, that revenue is audited every year to ensure that it is going back to the intended place it's supposed to be. That was the reason. So we can't ignore the fact that when we passed that bill a few years ago, it pulled the rug out from under our sheriffs. The guys who got elected not knowing that that rug was going to be pulled, now they're left with a time where they've got to find a way to keep these things going. Not that we don't have cars, not that we don't have ammunition, and not that we don't have bulletproof vests, but we have to be able to maintain operations because we all do demand professional law enforcement services regardless of county or city. And I agree with that, you know, but I also see say this, I had a relative that worked for Mobile County Sheriff's Department 60 years ago. They had two deputies on the whole county. Now we have probably 30 at a time, at least 30 at a time. So things have changed and that was the reason during that time to help fund the sheriffs and stuff. But it's, the fact of the matter is this this permit bill has been going on for, for over 10 years. So I'd say 10 to 15 years. And the, the sheriffs have been advised and given opportunity for the last 10 years. And I understand that some of the new sheriffs that's gotten elected don't understand, you know, wasn't a part of that, but they've been informed by different legislatures over the years to get their house and their finances in order that this wouldn't stay there forever. And they have not done it, so they have failed to do that. The other is, you know, there was lots of problems with the permit system. We, we didn't have, 67 counties had 67 different looking permits. We begged them to try to fix that. It didn't happen. Uh, we put together a, a database uh, that allows officers to know when somebody's prohibited on a traffic stop to address that. There was issues within the permit system of, a police officer could stop you after hours on the weekends. Most of the permit offices was not even open. You didn't know if it was a good permit or not. It could be fake, it could be revoked, it could be bad, it could be counterfeit. That was a danger. The, uh, the ATF audited the, the sheriff permit system twice, and one time it was like 21 agencies wasn't even running backgrounds, issuing permits to felons. So. A lot of the issues and problems that, that created the permit bill was because of lack of my saying is you police yourself, nobody else has to do it. And that, that's why that came to, to the blow of that bill passing. But to sit here and say that we're going to start charging for every service that they're, they're budgeted to do is wrong. And we shouldn't do it. Thank you. Sure, thanks to the gentleman. Sure, recognize the gentleman from Town Digger, Representative Robin. Hey, Representative Betzel. Uh, I appreciate the words that uh, Representative Stringer just said. And there were a few things in the bill that I had questions about. Uh, one of which is on every filing and every process, there's a $50 fee. $5 goes to the clerk and $3 to the district attorney. So even on a civil case, the district attorney would get $3. So if I file for divorce, if I file to evict someone, the district attorney that has no, nothing to do with that matter still gets $3. That's right. And uh, was AOC involved in this bill? We've had discussions with them, certainly, through this whole process. Uh, they were responsible for the amendments um, that they were a party to the process of uh, establishing the amendments that were placed in committee. When I'm, I'm talking about the administrative office, of course, not the bar. So, so if you had conversations or get, I, I, gotten a recommendation from the administrative office, of course. Yes, absolutely. 
So do you have a report that's been given to the legislature on advising us on whether we should add this court cost or not? I don't have a report now. So um, I know that this was before both of us were here, that we had a judicial study commission formed to review court costs. And you told Judge Hill earlier that this is viewed as a court cost. And the recommendation of the judicial study commission would be that prior to filing the bill or one month prior, that court cost bill would be given to AOC to make a recommendation to the legislature on whether we should enact it or not. We don't have to take their advice, but there was a procedure set in place and we have not been, we have not received that. And, you know, based upon some of the comments we've heard today, I think that we just need to kind of pump the brakes and get that recommendation or report from AOC. For, so for that, Representative Betzel, I'm gonna ask that we uh, carry this bill over. So I, I guess I'll, I'll make a motion that we carry this over to get a report from AOC. Okay, you've had the, heard the motion from the gentleman to carry the bill over. Question for the body, if you want to carry the vote over, your vote will be aye. If you don't, your vote will be no. Clerk will unlock the machine and the members will vote. That's fine. Clerk lock machine, record the votes. 82 ayes, 11 noes. HB 255 has been carried over. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Thank you, gentlemen. Clerk, call next bill. On page 24 of the calendar, House Bill number 182 by Representative Lipscomb with substitute relating to property. Representative Lipscomb, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, currently in, in our nation, we're experiencing an epidemic of individuals who are fighting themselves on people's properties and we're having difficulty establishing who has the right to be where they should be and where they should not be. Uh, this has become even more evident as we've had even illegal aliens within the nation who would be TikTok influencers um, explaining to millions of followers how they can illegally squat upon the premises of rightful property owners. What this bill will do is it will address this situation before it comes and becomes an epidemic in the state of Alabama. Now, we do have problems that we have to address, but fortunately, we do not have the same sort of problems as some of our adjacent states do. For example, if you travel all the way up to New York City, if you were to inhabit someone's property for as few as 30 days, you can legally claim that as your own property. We don't want anything of that sort to happen here. Some people would say that this is a bill about squatter's rights, and I would suggest that it's not about squatter's rights, it's about owner's rights. And so with that, Mr. Speaker, I'd ask for the BIR. Chair, recognize gentleman from Mobile, Representative Sherry. On a squatter's bill this term? No, sir. Not with dealing with trucks or something like that? Oh, well, different kinds of squatters. <laughs> no, I appreciate you what you're doing with this bill and I understand. I, I thought it was very alarming what's going on in different places. So I think this is something that we did need to address. So I appreciate you bringing the bill. Thank you, Representative. You don't want to get. Sure, recognize the gentleman from Shelby, Representative Mooney. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I do not have a personal interest in this bill, even though I'm a commercial realtor, because we don't have this problem in commercial real estate. However, I know from the complaints that I've received from constituents, uh, some of whom are residential realtors, some of whom are property owners, some of whom are, you know, folks who 
had leases on property and couldn't get into the property and that type of thing. It's not rampant here, but with friends that I work with out of state, what we have coming our way here is what's going on in the city of Atlanta right now. 1,500 plus properties with squatters in them who've got to be evicted and dealt with. I appreciate so much you bringing a bill that's good for the people of our state, families that have got homes that they're trying to either sell or take care of. And I mean, in the case of the area where I live, there are a number of people who live there summer or winter, depending on where they're actually from, and they go back, there's no telling if we didn't, didn't do something like this to protect them from the squatter process that occurs. And you see these homes and all of a sudden you see five, six, seven cars around them and you're going, how do I find out if that's really the people? You know, it makes you want to really know your neighbors a little bit better in the process so you can watch after them. So thank you so much for bringing it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. And she recognizes the gentleman from Dale, Representative Klaus. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Lipscomb, I've been talking to you about this bill. I appreciate you bringing it. Uh, and, and I think the issue one of my constituents has is addressed here, but I'm not, I'm not for sure dealing with what he calls adverse possession, where someone, and it may be more of a landline dispute, where someone may have put a fence up 20 or 30 feet over next door on the adjoining property and 20 years later claims that's his property there, that 20 feet or whatever. Right. So I hope this will address that. I think it does. And if not, we, we may need to get with the, the Real Estate Association to put an amendment on in the Senate or so somewhat. It should address it. Yeah. The difficulty when you're dealing with dirt as opposed to structures right. is that you have to establish boundaries to know what belongs to whomever. So that could become a much more arduous process in which you have to uh, validate exactly where those property lines may be. Um, it will be a bit easier when you're dealing with a dwelling or some other structure in which it is very readily evident that someone should or should not be within that property. Um, but this should also address the, the boundary line issues for uh, real estate of that sort as well. Yeah. Thank you for bringing this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. Chair sure recognize the lady from Jefferson, Regina Van, be the fourth person to speak on the BR. I want to say thank you for bringing this bill. Now, I have been one who I fight the fight for urban campers and, and have done so, so I don't want anybody tweeting me or texting me. I believe that in the scripture that the poor will be with us always. But this situation with squatters has gotten out of hand. Uh, someone came up a moment ago and mentioned Atlanta. You don't have to go to Atlanta. You can just. And it is, it is ridiculous, and it is getting to be so common that it has gotten beyond common to a level of acceptability that it is so far, it is so in the norm that it further enhances the individuals that are doing this. They believe and they have taken on rights that they just do not have. Yes, ma'am. And, and, it, and it, it, it's, it's, it's something when you see folks literally now, if you don't have money to eat, get a job and do this, but you literally can go and get wood and build you a sanctuary, your own home in the middle of downtown or in someone else's yard that you do not own mm -hmm. and live through all of the elements, something has got to be done about this. And, you know, I don't care if the mayor likes it or the city of Birmingham, call me if you don't like it. <laughs> this ain't what you want. Yes, I can tell you that. Thank you. So, and I know he has the thing of try Jesus, don't try me. Well, I'm going to say that to him because this is getting so out of control. Even when I drive to work, 
two, three area streets over. I called Representative Sellers. I said, Representative, this, it's getting so out of hand. So I appreciate you bringing this bill. I hope that something is done, but we also need to come up with something for the homeless. So I do not want that to be lost, but what is going on here, I feel it's just an outright takeover of our communities, mm -hmm. of our storefronts, of our, of, our, um, of our property rights and things of that nature. And, and it, it's just totally unacceptable. So I just wanted to come up here because I've been trying to get to the microphone. And so the speaker complimented me on my hair. And I said, well, Mr. Speaker, I finally had to come up with some and wear some new hair because I wouldn't get no play getting up to the microphone with the short hair. So I had hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got up to the microphone with short hair. At home, maybe the new hair would do it. So, <laughs> so, but I appreciate you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> but uh, I just want to tell you, I appreciate this bill. Yes, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you. Chair, thanks, lady. Question for the body now is the adoption of the BOR. Clerk, unlock the machine. The members vote. <laughs> Clerk of Lock Machine recorded those 96 I zero nays. BR has been adopted. Mr. Presented. Speaker, we have a committee substitute. Chair, to explain your substitute. Yes, sir. The uh, the original bill was uh, was drafted and it was um, it was a bit lacking uh, with some details. So the substitute broadens up broadens up and creates uh, some penalties and addresses some of the issues that the first original bill did not. Representative Sellers, you want to speak on the sub or the bill? The bill. Ms. Hall, the sub or the bill? Okay. Question for the body now is passage of the committee sub. Clerk will unlock the sheet and the members will vote. <laughs> Clerk will lock the sheet. Record the votes. 97 by 0 and the committee sub has been adopted. Representative Lipscomb. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With that, I'd ask for final passage. Chair recognizes the general from Jefferson. Representative Sellers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, with the gentleman yield. Yes, sir. Thank you for uh, this piece of legislation. Um, Representative Gavan and I just had this conversation maybe no more than one or two weeks prior about squatters within uh, our community and within our county. Mm -hmm. And um, as we look at squatters, um, I wish uh, as a whole, we could also look at, um, as she phrased it, our urban campers. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'm a proponent to take care of what will be with us always. That's biblical. Um, but we also have to make sure that we protect our community, protect our businesses, protect our properties, and protect our people. Yes, thank you, sir. I'm sympathetic to both urban and suburban campers, but we must protect the rights of property owners as well. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. Chair, recognize the lady from Madison, Representative Hall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the gentleman yield? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, there was a term, illegal aliens. What are those? What's an illegal alien? That, that would be someone who is in the country without appropriate authorization to be so. And is that a, a, I mean, is that generally a major problem? Because as I, you know, I don't, I mean, I see people that are homeless, so I'm not able to determine whether, you know, whether they're uh, an undocumented citizen or not. But that that was used as one of the reasons we have this problem. Is that a major um, is that a major issue for us? Because I have not seen that evidence. Not that I had anybody to identify it. So I think it's more of a regional matter. You find more of the illegal aliens, perhaps in other states, who are doing squatting, and perhaps in the southeast fewer still. So the majority of the squatters who are in this region of the country are perhaps not so many illegal aliens as what you might find on the uh, west coast, perhaps. So the undocumented citizens that we see, that it, it's for outside of the state, but they were mentioned as one of the reasons. The individuals that present we see that are homeless, and I'm not support, I'm not speaking as I'm opposed to the bill, I'm speaking as the um, knowing that people I'll give you a good example of folks that don't have, a, will not have a place to live. Mm -hmm. Housing authority is torn down in a district. Mm -hmm. 
They're given a voucher. That voucher, no place in the city, they can't find find a place. And I'm the, I don't I don't want them squatting in my property. I'm that's not what right. I'm saying. The other part of that, as I said, we also need to be looking at how we can address that concern. Yes, ma'am. We have a lot of building going going on in Madison County. But we also, I also see a large number of homeless people that they, they're squatting in an area in my, but it's not, it's in behind some trees to be out of sight. Now I, you know, and I know that somebody's property, but I also know these individuals don't have a place to go. Right, there are many transient people and we need to rehabilitate in some fashion or another. I think that's a separate matter from what we're talking today, but I think we need to address getting those individuals into a place that they can call a permanent residence so that they can begin the process of getting their life back together and getting them back in, into the workforce and doing the things that every good citizen should be doing. I, and I agree with that. I'm, I just said, I just think that as we deal with this issue of not only the undocumented citizens or individuals, but also people that are li that have been living in the area are finding themselves without a place to call home. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, thanks, lady. Sure, recognize the gentleman from Dallas, Representative Chester. Does the gentleman yield? Of course. I just want to thank you for this much needed legislation. Um, I've been reading a lot about this squatting issue over the last month or so. And my understanding is that in New York City, there are two really egregious examples of why we need a law like this. Uh, one was a, a gentleman, and I use that term loosely, who drives a Range Rover SUV, went into a $1 million home, then allowed migrants to come in to the home, and then he demanded $18,000 to be paid to him in order for him to release it. Then the other story was a, a couple I believe they were in Colorado, they live in Colorado. They bought a $2 million home they were going to retire and go live in. And a guy who drives a BMW SUV goes into their $2 million home and squats, mm -hmm. says it's his now. And so what they did was they hired Bill Gates' daughter security guard to stand outside, wait, because at some point he's gonna get hungry enough, he's gonna have to leave. And then he's going to run in and commandeer the house. But people should not have to go through those measures. That's right. To protect their own property. That's right. So thank you for this bill. And um, thank you so much. Thank you, Representative. God bless you. Yes. Sure. Thanks, gentlemen. Sure. Recognize the lady from Mobile, Representative Drummond. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the gentleman yield? Yes, ma'am. I, too, wanted to join the chorus of thanking you. I was, for our spring break, I went to South Carolina, Columbia, and there was a $500,000 house that was in the neighborhood where I was staying, and it was so, I'd never heard of this until then. But not only did these people move in, the owner had to and I forgot what they call the company. They had to hire a company who is making money off of these poor property owners to get these folks out of their house. Yeah. And I thought that was the craziest thing. It is. The house had been left by a, a dead mom. And, and here was this family. They were out of town. They had to fly in. 
And then they had to hire a company to go and say, you're squatting in, in my property that belongs to me. So I just wanted to say thank you. Yes, ma'am. And I, I, I was sitting there listening because I had no idea it was also happening here in Alabama. Not, not a tremendous amount, but we want to be proactive and not reactive. Well, I, I, it was... <laughs> When, when I saw it happening there in South Carolina, and I saw it with my own eyes, and these folks actually had Mercedes mm. who had squatted into this house. That's a shame. And law enforcement was telling the property owners, you know, we can't do anything. Mm. So again, I just wanted to join the chorus and say thank you for bringing this piece of legislation. Thank you. Chair, thanks, lady. Quest for the body now is final passage of HB 182 as substituted. Clerk will unlock the machine. The members will vote. <laughs> Clerk will lock the machine. Court vote 101 eyes, 0 nays, 182 as passed as substituted. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to open this up for co-sponsors, if you would, please. That is question, Mr. Clerk. Let's open up for co-sponsors. <laughs> Got A1 co-sponsors to lock the machines. Thank you for your work on this, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Clerk, call next bill. On page 29 of the calendar, Senate Bill number 95 by Senator Figures relating to tobacco products. Pro temp Ringo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, this bill simply raises the age to possess a vaping product to 21, just like it is to possess tobacco or alcohol. With that, I move adoption of the BIR. As questions, adoption of the BIR, clerk one lock the machine, the members vote. <laughs> Clerk Lock Machine, record the votes. 100 eyes, zero nays. The BR has been adopted, Mr. Pro Tem. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. With that, I move final passage of SB 95. That's questions. Final passage. Clerk one lock machine, the members vote. <laughs> uh, Clerk Lock Machine, record the vote. 103 eyes, zero nays. SB 95 has passed. Mr. Speaker, I've had a request to open the machine for sponsors. Co sponsor. Mr. Clerk, let's open it up for co sponsor, please. Oh, it's the Senate bill. We can't do that. Okay. I have had a one. Thank you, Representative Jackson. <laughs> Clerk, call next bill. On page 18 of the calendar, House Bill number 220 with substitute by Representative Ellis relating to taxation. Chairman Ellis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the recognition. Um, members, HB 220, I want to be real clear, does not create any kind of tax or raise any kind of new tax. What it does is close the loophole. Our lodging tax on short-term rentals is a vital source to the general fund and state lo and local tourism. It's a 4% tax, 75%, as all of you know, goes to the general fund, 25% to tourism. In 2023, that revenue was about $114 million, but we estimate, uh, and I think this is going to be low, frankly, I think we estimate that about $26 million uh, did not get collected. Um, the problem is online booking platforms, your Airbnbs and such, when they book them, uh, the tax becomes due, but often the property owner does not realize that uh, or, or dodges that and does not uh, pay them and they never get collected. Um, they do become due at the time of the rental. What this bill does, it makes online booking platforms uh, collect and remit that, that tax. This kind of levels the playing field for our Alabama businesses and the good actors that are already doing uh, what they're supposed to be uh, doing. Mr. Speaker, with that, uh, I, I ask for the BIR. That is questions BIR on HB 220. Clerk one lock machine, the members will vote. <laughs> Clerk Lock Machine, court vote, 103 eyes, zero nays. BR has been adopted. Chairman Ellis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do have a committee sub. Could you explain your sub to us, please? Absolutely. 
Um, so what the sub does with, in, in negotiations with the re realtors and others, um, it, it exempts property management companies, uh, people who manage ho uh, apartments, hotels, tourism boards, and things. Those are our in-state people, the good actors, the ones that are already collecting taxes. And so um, it, um, it, it, if they're already remitting it, then they, it doesn't touch them. So that was in negotiations with the, with the realtors and others. Okay, you've heard the explanation of the committee sub. Clerk will unlock the machine and the members will vote. <laughs> Clerk will lock the machine, record the vote, 103 I 0 and the committee sub has been adopted. Chairman Ellis. Now, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We also have a floor amendment. Clerk, see the amendment. Amendment to House Bill number 220 by Representative Ellis. Representative Ellis, to uh, thank explain. You, yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, this does a, a couple of things. One, um, it makes sure that the local part of the um, lodging tax is collected as, as well as the state. It also, th through negotiations uh, with the RV owners, it, it also exempts them, uh, our in-state folks, and that was negotiations with them, and Representative Lee uh, brought that to my attention. Um, and it makes sure that people, principal residents are not affected. Okay, you've heard the explanation of the floor sub. Clerk will unlock the machine, the members vote. <laughs> Clerk will lock the machine, record the votes, 101 I, zero nays. The floor sub has been adopted. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And if there's no further questions, I'll call for final passage. Chair recognizes a gentleman from Jefferson, Representative Rafty. Thank you for the recognition, Mr. Speaker. Uh, just a quick question for you. Um, is there any distinction between kind of these, these folks that buy up a lot of different properties and are renting them out versus somebody who might just have a spare room and their, their primary residence or home? Is there any distinction that's made there? Not, not in, in this bill, um, because if it's somebody's primary residence or somebody is, is it's not a short-term rental, if it doesn't fall in that short-term rental that, that triggers the lodging tax, then it, then it wouldn't be. Uh, well, what would that short-term rental? Okay, so then what's the threshold to be a, be considered a short-term rental then? Uh, six months. Yeah, I'm looking for a nod. Six months. So if I have primary residence, I rent out my room through Airbnb or one of these platforms to somebody who's going to be there for, um, you know, the state of their job is bringing them in to town to do something um, with that. Yes, so so that would already under current law, it would the, the tax would be due even currently today, if we didn't pass this. All this does is change and makes the online platform collect it. If you're renting it yourself, taxes still do, but that's on you to. All right, thank you. All right. I just want to clarify that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair, thanks the gentleman. Question for the body is final passage of HB 220 as sub. Clerk will unlock the machine and the members of vote. Clerk will lock the machine, record the votes, 100 Y, zero nays, HB 220 has passed. Now, thank you, Ms. Speaker, and if I can, for just a second, I'd like to thank Bobby Crawford, one of our interns. He's been with the, this the whole time, negotiations, all the meetings, and he's been very helpful, and I want to take a minute to recognize him and thank him yeah. for his help. Let's give Bobby a hand for his work. Congratulations. Thank you, members. Clerk, call next bill. On page 33 of the calendar, House Bill number 307 was substitute by Representative Oliver relating to 911 districts. Chairman Oliver, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this bill attempts to create a process for 911 collaboration amongst uh, point of service answering points statewide. Uh, when you make a 911 call, that's where that call actually goes to, where it's answered by a call taker. Uh, the the history of our 911 uh, PSAPs is is kind of storied. This legislation is a priority for the Alabama Association of 911 Districts and it's supported by the Alabama 911 board. 
Alabama has remained the national leader in its provision of, of 911 services to citizens since the nation's first ever 911 call was placed right here in Alabama in Winston County. That was in 1968. But the ever-changing technology necessary to maintain these 911 services can, very, uh, can be very costly. And for some 911 centers, the most effective and efficient way to deliver these services in today's environment is to partner with the fellow center. So what we're talking about doing is giving 911 boards and counties the ability to combine these 911 services. Uh, while some 911 centers have expressed interest in partnering with other 911 centers, current Alabama law does not provide a process for doing so. This bill therefore proposes the establishment of a process for 911 centers to voluntarily coordinate operational services using the following guidelines. Now that means a 911 center can enter into a contract with another for a time frame not to exceed three years. Members of the public must be given the opportunity to present data, views, and arguments on any proposed plans. Notice of a public hearing on the 911 plan must be provided pursuant in the Open Meetings Act. Contracting districts must adopt identical resolutions laying out the terms of the contract and the governing boards of any contracting 911 district shall remain intact. And uh, at this time, I would like to ask for the BIR. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Jefferson, Chairman Garrett. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will you yield? You mentioned the first 911 call was placed in 1968 in Winston County. I feel uh, compelled to clarify, or further clarify, on behalf of my wife, Mrs. Garrett, that that was in Haleville, Alabama, Haleville. which is her hometown. So thank you very much for the bill. Thank you. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. A question for the body now is the adoption of the BIR. Clerk will unlock the machine and the members will vote. <laughs> Clerk will lock the machine, record vote. 100 eyes. So. Care to explain your sub to us, please? Uh, it just changed some of the language. Uh, it means that what we added was that the state 911 board must be notified before we make any of these changes. You've heard the explanation of the committee sub. Clerk will unlock the machine and the members will vote. Clerk will lock the machine and record the votes. 102 eyes, one day. The committee sub has been adopted. Chairman Oliver. Thank you. That's final passage. That's a question for the body. It's final passage of HB 307. As substituted, clerk will unlock the machine and the members will vote. <laughs> clerk will lock the machine, record vote 102 I 0 and A's. HB 307 has passed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and body. Thank you, gentlemen. Clerk, call next bill. On page 28 of the calendar, House Bill number 188 with substitute by Representative Collins relating to education. Chairwoman Collins, you're recognized. Thank you for the recognition, Mr. Speaker. House Bill 188 has seen many, many years. It's seen about 40 amendments added to it, and it has worked its way through the process till I think people are finally pleased with it. What it does, we're one of about two states that don't have a minimum standard for a due process for students before they are long-term expelled or suspended. And so what this does, using very much like best practices for um, some of our very high-performing school systems, it sets a minimum standard that would let the student and their family find out what the offense they're being accused of, give them a chance to defend themselves. Then they can still, at that local level, make the decision what they need to do and what's right, but it does set up a due process which we've not had in the past. And so I would ask um, to pass the BIR. Chair recognize the lady from Jefferson representing the land. Mm -hmm. Lady Collins, yes. Tell me again what your bill does. 
Tell you what, tell me what your bill does. Exactly. It sets up a due process. Alabama currently does not have a due process in a code to give a student before they are long term over 10 days expelled or um, suspended from school, from regular school. This doesn't include ISS and um, it actually extends it longer if it's an alternative school. But it um, sets up a process so that that student has one chance to tell their side before that suspension happens and before they have to take it to a judicial process. Okay, I'm, I'm slow, but I'm show sure at times. Okay, help me, walk me through this. Child A. It's suspended mm -hmm. for fight. Now, not suspended. This is just if it's long term, over two weeks. But there, but what? Okay, then my question to you then is, what have they been doing? Because even if someone's suspended or class three, there is a process. I don't know what it happens in other school systems, but I know in Jefferson County there is a hearing process for which those charges have been brought and not out. If it's a judicial hearing or a hearing within the school system? It's a hearing within the school system. Itself. Not all have that. And this Not all just, systems in the state have that? And that's what this would set up that as a just bare minimum. And then they would... I, I, and, and, and again, I've never known anybody in Jefferson County where their child has been suspended. Uh, that's typically, I, I will give our school boards credit for that. They, they go through a step for their, for which due process. And this is probably very much exactly what they're doing. It just says it would be a minimum standard for our state. So what process is employed now? There's not a unified standard. So it could be different in every place. And how they walk through it can still look different in every place. This would just be a minimum based on some of the things that other good systems are doing. Okay. Sure, thanks, lady. What's for the body now is the adoption of the BIR. Clerk will unlock the sheet and the members will vote. <laughs> Clerk will lock the sheet and court of those stand for eyes, four days. The BIR has been adopted. Madam Chair. I move to adopt the sub. It included some of those very many amendments and changes that we talked about to get everybody to agree. Okay, you've already heard the explanation of the sub that was adopted in uh, committee. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Clark, Representative Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I want to give some reference to some attorneys that you can call for some to do some suing. Madam, Madam, uh, is, it, is this bill going to codify or is it going to unify the code of uh, expulsion in the state of Alabama? All it's going to say is before they are long term expelled, not for just a few days, over two weeks that it would say that that student has one opportunity to tell their side of the story in the school system. Okay, so we're gonna make every school system have that opportunity. I mean, schools, they're doing that now in mind. Most of them, many of them, I can't tell you the exact number, are very much. I know we uh, had one school system that came to talk about it, and this is the process they're using. Okay. We just wanted to have a, a minimum standard for due process Uniform standards. for students. Okay, now, how, how this works, what, what, what's the difference between the original and the sub? Oh, about 40 different things are different. We've taken a whole lot out. We've taken out parts that dealt with if it was against the code or against the um, conduct. We've, um, hold on, I've got a list of many of those okay. right here. Um, we've de deleted entire sections. We've added um, the alternative school and we've extended that from over two weeks to over three weeks. We've talked about, we've added substantial, um, substantial disruption. Um, we've added, um, numerous things. Okay. We protected anybody that was at that hearing. If they're not there, they can't be questioned. Um, we've oh, told, changed. Are we, are, we, are, we, are we protecting the students? 
that's what this is designed it's, to it's, do, that's give whole, that student a due process. That's, that, that's what we want for, for, the, for the students to have that opportunity. But I have an issue sometimes with some systems. They'll suspend or, or expel a, a child into alternative school for the rest of the year. That's, this would be, that child would have an opportunity to tell their side before that happened. That's what this is about. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Chair, thanks, Jim. The question for the body now is the adoption of the sub. Clerk will unlock the machine and members will vote. There's one person, John, that his service passed like two years ago. Sarah Stewart has passed her time. Stand Clerk to lock the machine, record the votes, 95 eyes, five, five nays, the sub has been adopted. Thank you, I move for final passage. That is questions, final passage of HB 188 as sub. Clerk on the lock machine, the members vote. <laughs> <laughs> Clerk will lock the machine, record the votes, 96 I, zero, uh, five days, HB 188 has passed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, body. Thank Roll you, lady. Tide. Clerk, call the next bill. On page 12 of the calendar, House Bill number 215, with substitute by Representative Fiddler relating to natural resources. Representative Fiddler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I am honored to present the Joe Faust Living Shoreline Act. Um, this act will allow us uh, regular homeowners that own land, landowners along our coastal waterways uh, to, um, it'll be a financial incentive to uh, install natural living shorelines versus bulkheads, or in some people's mind, those are seawalls. So um, in honor of Representative Faust, who uh, supports clean water and has worked on these endeavors for years, um, we are, uh, I, I'm proposing HB 215. Um, and with that, I'll call for the BR. The question for the body is adoption of the BR. Clerk will unlock the machine and the members will vote. Probably too long. Okay, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Clerk will lock the machine, record the votes. 101 I, zero nays. The BR has been adopted. Representative Fiddler. Um, we do have a committee substitute, Mr. Speaker. You care to explain your sub to us? Yes, sir. Um, this primarily, this just takes the Alabama Department of Environmental Management out of the permitting fees. The Department of Natural Resource Conservation um, have agreed to cut their fees in half, and that is the financial incentive of this bill. And um, that is all it does. So with that, I ask for um, the passage of the substitute. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Clark, Representative Jackson, speaking on the sub. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I want to, to commend the lady in a manner of, of honoring Joe. Joe, Joe Faust, your great friend, great statesman here in this body for many years. But you want to take away the fees of the, could you explain why you want to eliminate the environmental protection? Uh, yes, sir. It's not, we're not eliminating environmental protection. We're just eliminating half the permit fees for the Department of Natural Resource Conservation Service. So um, it's a fiscal note of 50, about $5,200 annually. So it's not a huge hit. But what it does is says, the state of Alabama says, this is important. Uh, natural shorelines are important. We can reduce erosion from landowners that live along uh, waterways. This only affects people in Mobile and Baldwin counties south of Interstate 10, and it it stops the erosion on properties that are on either side of bulkheads and encourages us to contain and protect our property. Um, 
Yes, sir. So you don't, you, you mean you're gonna, you're gonna get your landowner's protection about your protecting the erosion? We're gonna protect. I mean, you, you, I'm talking to shoreline, but, the, but you're eliminating the cost to live there by taking away the fees. No, sir. It's just a. It's just halving the permit fees. For example, if I have, I'm a landowner, and I have water along my waterfront. I I can to protect my land. I can either put in a bulkhead, which okay. is a hard seawall, or I can try to figure out how to put grasses or rocks or small vertical uh, seawalls that'll try to stop the sediment that naturally flows out to the Gulf of Mexico or comes back in as the tide comes in and out, which therefore it stops the sediment from going back and forth and we can protect the land. So we want to encourage the state of Alabama wants to encourage these natural living shorelines, uh, and this is one way we can do that by reducing the permit fees. You can do it better yourself than, than what you're saying. We can, um, well, usually we get permit fees, so we can maybe find someone to help us. A lot of people are not expert in this, this field. A was, lot that a, was that an annual fee? No, sir. It's a one-time fee. It's a one-time installation fee for landowners who wish to install uh, this type of um, feature in their their waterfront property. Now, what happens if if I don't protect my property in that manner and erosion does occur? You lose your property. I mean, you just you're, it just it just your sand and uh, it just flows out to the bays or to the Gulf of Mexico. I, I, I know where you. Are. I, I just want to try to figure out uh, you making a decision whether to do it than to have the agency do it for you. Well, no, sir. You're going to do it as a property owner. You're responsible for doing it. Okay. So you're either going to probably put a bulkhead. You're going to install a bulkhead. And what that bulkhead does, I don't know if um, you were able to see the handout. I had made sure everyone, I tried to make sure everyone got one, but it shows the natural living shoreline and exactly what it does. So these hard bulkheads, when the water comes and hits the hard bulkhead, right. the energy doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't does, take away the, 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 it doesn't erode what's behind it, it there. It erodes the sides of your bulkhead. Right. So you end up losing property. Your neighbors end up losing their property if they're north or south or on either side of your bulkhead. So as a state, we want to encourage people to think about that and we want to have a more natural way of incur you know, having this um, beach sand or just bay sand there with natural grasses or rocks or shells or that sort of thing so that we can stop that erosion from occurring before okay. or after the bulkhead. Appreciate it, thanks. Thank you. Chair, thanks and gentlemen. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Mobile, Rep. Chairman Brown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I heard it. <laughs> I was just parroting what you said there. <laughs> uh, with Representative Yield. Uh, yes. I want to I want to applaud you for bringing this on on a couple of fronts. One, it pays tribute to our friend Joe Faust, but also from an environmental standpoint, as we try to shift away from hard structures on the bay and on our, our lagoons and coastal waterways, uh, this this provides an opportunity for homeowners to be more environmentally friendly. That would would grow, uh, you know marshlands and that sort of thing within their property that that in, that's not such a hard structure so that fish crabs other sea life can can lay eggs and and keep it going the chain of cut chain of life going i think it's a it's a great bill i appreciate you bringing this and and uh and i, I think it's a great opportunity not just for the people of alabama i mean in mobile and Baltimore county but for the people of alabama so thank you for bringing this bill thank you representative brown you recognize the gentleman from Mobile, Representative Jones. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the recognition. Lady Yale. Yes, sir. I really came to just thank you for 
recognizing Joe Faust. Joe Faust is a great statesman. I work with him at the county government and here at the state government, and I don't think anyone is more deserving than Joe Faust. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor Jones. Thank you, gentlemen. Chair recognizes the lady from Mobile. General Chair Lady Wilcox. Under the Thank you for the recognition, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for bringing this bill. And I too want to recognize Representative Joe Faust, Chairman Faust. And um, I also would like to recognize uh, Dr. George Crozier, who is with the Dolphin Island Sea Lab. He had influenced me many years ago when I had when I had bought my waterfront property. So even I have kept the natural shoreline. The science has been out on this for a long time, but a lot of us are, it's just now getting out widespread. So I appreciate what you're doing for our environment and thank you for bringing this bill. Thank you, Representative Wilcox. Chair, sure, thanks, Lady. The question now is the adoption of the committee sub. Clerk will lock the machine and members of vote. <laughs> Clerk will lock the machine. 102 I, zero nays. The committee sub has been adopted. Representative Fiddler. Mr. Speaker, I've um, asked for final, final passage as amended. Okay. That's the question, is final passage as amended. Clerk one log machine, the members vote. Clerk lock machine, record the votes, 103 I, zero nays, HB 215 has been passed as amended. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I was asked um, to uh, open this up for co-sponsors, honoring Mr. Joe, Representative Joe Faust, um, if anyone. I think that would be appropriate. Yes, ma'am. Clerk, Mr. Clerk, if you'd unlock the machine for co-sponsors. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Clerk, lock the machine. Forward to co-sponsors, 97. Good work. Thank you for your work. Thank you. And thank you, Representative Faust. I hope he's watching today. Um, uh, thank you. Thank the lady. Clerk, call next bill. On page two of the calendar, House Bill number 29 by Representative England relating to habitual offenders. Representative England. I move for the BR. <laughs> um, thank you for the recognition. Um, this is House Bill 29. Um, it's commonly called the Second Chance Bill. Um, it deals with habitual offenders who were sentenced to life without parole and who are currently serving in our uh, prison system. Um, it passed out of here um, last session and died on one of the last days of the session in the Senate. Um, and in the process of when it passed last year to when it's in front of you today, um, there are also further amendments that are being added to um, make this bill a little bit more palatable for all of us. Um, and in an effort to address a lot of the concerns that I've been hearing, um, I'm going to go ahead and um, give you a heads up on some of the things and some of the changes that are going to be made and some of the changes that I am going to go ahead and suggest ahead of time in, in an amendment if this bill does in fact get to be R. One of the things that we've heard a lot of is that there's a potential for individuals to be released that may have harmed someone in one of their priors. So uh, if this bill were to get to be R, um, I'm going to offer an amendment to it that says that the individual has no prior convictions for any, if any offense involving physical injury to another person. So in order to be to be eligible for resentencing, you, none of the priors that you have that led to your life without parole sentence can involve a physical injury to another person. Um, there were also several um, issues that were identified by the district attorneys, including um, the additional workload and the notice that's been, that, that they may be required to, uh, to do. And we've come up with amendments to try to deal with that as well. And I want to stress something. Um, this is not a mass release of anybody. 
Um, what it is, is an opportunity if you meet very specific set of circumstances to be eligible for review for resentencing. As it stands right now, if this bill were to pass, it only deals with a, about 150 people who are currently incarcerated. Those individuals have to serve at least 25 years of the sentence, and they have had to, throughout that sentence, demonstrate to the public that, and demonstrate to those in, in, uh, in, in, within our prison system that they are not only uh, been rehabilitated, but they will, uh, it's somebody that we can safely release back to the public and it will be a very low risk or no risk at all. Now, also, it sunsets. So after five years, it goes away. So it's not a permanent process. At most, five counties in the state of Alabama will be impacted the most. More than half of the counties in the state will not be impacted at all. Again, since there's such a small number of people and such a small window and also such a specific set of circumstances that allow for your review, it's a very limited number. And it goes back to the county where the offense occurred to the people who know the individual the most. Even the sentencing judge who was there initially is the person that does the review. Also, just to make sure that we don't burden the district attorneys, as, 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 as minimize that burden as much as possible. There is a victim notification system that's going to be offered through an amendment that can also be used to notify the victim so the district attorney does not have to if that system can be used. The amendments also guarantee that the victim has a right to be heard at this hearing. The amendments also guarantee that the, dis that the, the district attorney has a right to be heard at the hearing. So with that, Mr. Speaker, um, I'm here to answer any questions. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Dale, Representative Klaus. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative England, uh, just if you can remember, tell me what the bill did last year without any amendments that you're anticipating. Um, it specifically, like what I mentioned before, it created a review process as long as the person who's serving life without parole meets a specific set of circumstances that are listed in the bill. If you want me to, I can read some of those out to you. Okay. Um, the, uh, so first, the individual was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. The individual received a final sentence at the trial court prior to May 26 of 2024, or 20, well, it's not 2024, but May 26 of 2000. Um, also, the individual was sentenced pursuant to 13A-5-9, which is habitual offender. For any offense other than homicide, a sex offense, or an offense that caused serious physical injury to another person as defined in 13A-1-2. And then um, the amendment will add to, to the eligibility standard that you couldn't have harmed, no physical injury could have occurred in any, any of your priors. So that's essentially what it did. And then also you've added additional circumstances that the court has to consider when this review process is underway that it must, taking consideration the underlying offense, the individual's conduct while being incarcerated, the age of the individual at the time the motion is filed, including any relevant research in terms of their risk to reoffend, the individual's likelihood of success after release, so that's part of the hearing, whether the individual used a firearm in furtherance of the offense, if so, the judge has to give that considerable weight in, in determining whether or not they're eligible, and, um, you can only do it one time. You can't continue to do it. You, 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 you apply for review, if the judge denies it, or the judge decides not even to hear it, you only get one chance at it. So that's essentially what it does. Okay, now, there's this, maybe another bill I'm thinking about, but did we pass a bill that applied to a certain uh, amount of people that were sentenced um, between a certain year, and, and then we had to come back and, and try to 
I don't think this. I don't. I don't think. Or is that a different bill? Or I think it was a different bill. Uh, this bill, like I said, deals with a very small, specific set of circum circumstances and individuals who are currently incarcerated. That, for the full, for, when you purpose for full disclosure, if they were convicted at another time, they'd probably already be out. Right. Yeah. But, but we passed it last year. Yeah, it, it went to the Senate and died on last day. It got out of committee, and it was on the last day, and it died. They didn't get on the special order. So, thank you, Speaker. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. The chair recognizes the general from Henry, Richard Green. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> so I just want to get a good understanding of this. I think you just covered some of this. Yep. Uh, so there was a group of inmates that were convicted under the older three strikes law. Right. And so many of them, well, well, could you tell me about how many we're talking about ballpark? Right now, so it, with the additional amendment that we're going to add, saying that you can't have harmed anybody, no physical injury at all, and your priors, probably around 150. Okay, because prior to that amendment, it's, it's about 300, wasn't it? 200 or something? Uh, it started off at 300, and then the process that we went through last year, we worked with so many people, the AG's office, um, both people on both sides of the aisle. Uh, it was whittled down from about 300 to about 180, and then this amendment that I'm, we're going to offer today, We'll whittle it down to about 150. Yeah. And I, I voted for the bill last last year. Um, I just want to make sure everybody understands this is not, you know, like automatically these inmates are, are being released. They have to go through a process in which uh, it goes before a judge and they use all the, 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 the things that you had mentioned that they have to look at. And so uh, many of these uh, may not uh, find release and, and be released. No. No. And there may be a few that do. I mean, and, and the judge can you mean unilaterally deny it, um, and that's it. There's no appeal to it. There's no further review. If the judge denies it, that's it. And many of these individuals who served over 25 years in prison are well over 60, 65 years old. A lion's share of them actually are. Um, and if you're able to make it through the process of 25 years in prison and maintain a, a relatively clean record um, and and adding in the fact that if you were sentenced at a different time, you'd likely be out already anyway. Um, in my opinion, it's just uh, it's just to me, it feels like the right thing to do. So a judge would be able to take all that in account what their uh, uh, record as an inmate was and, and, you know, they've been on good behavior all this time. Can you kind of give me an estimate of how long, what, what is the, say, the shortest any of these inmates in this category? Uh, because this ended in 2000, was it? Right. It, you so. Would, so imagine that we start today. Um, it'd have to pass first, go into effect, and be the, the date was going to effect. So it, by, by the time they have a hearing on it, every individual that'd be eligible for this would have served at least 25 years in prison. So, yeah, that, that's my point. So all these inmates have served 25 years in prison. Yeah. You're making an amendment so that uh, all, the only ones eligible have not harmed anybody. Right. You know, any physical harm. So. Uh, yeah, at, at the end of the day, I, I've, I've looked at some of these uh, stories, and uh, there's some individuals, you know, that it just seems unreasonable that they're serving a lifetime, you know, which is basically a death sentence in prison. Right. And so uh, I am going to vote for this bill, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. Chair recognizes the, the gentleman from Jefferson, Representative Rafferty. Thank you for the recognition. Um, Representative England, I just wanted to commend you. I know that you've put a lot of work over many years on this bill. Um, you've worked with a lot of different people and you've had try to bring everyone that would that, that this would affect all the stakeholders to the table to make sure that you bring the best bill forward um that's not just good for the state but but good for the people of alabama so just want to commend you on all that hard work and uh look forward to supporting this bill thank you i appreciate that chair thanks the gentleman chair recognizes the general from lauderdale representative pettis be the fourth person to speak on the br
gentleman yield. I'm not sure. <laughs> no, of course. One question on the physical injury. Armed robbery is not a physical injury, right? As long as I didn't shoot you, as long as I pointed a gun at you, you would still be, this would still cover you. But if I shot you, you wouldn't be. Is that right? That's right. Okay. That's all I need. Question for the body now is the adoption of the BIR. Clerk one lock and sheen the members of vote. <laughs> <laughs> Clerk Lock Machine and Court of Votes. I didn't, it's not, I didn't get it. 50 eyes, 48 nays. The BR fails. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Clerk, call the next bill. On page 27 of the calendar, Senate Bill number 106 by Senator Kitchens relating to the Commerce Department. Chairman Sales. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the House has already passed a version of this exact bill. This is actually our friend Senator Kitchens' first bill in the Senate, so we're doing it down here in the House today. And what this simply does, it brings the Commerce Commissioner and Deputy Commissioner under the uh, guidelines of the Governor Cabinet uh, pay scale. As for BIR. Chair sure, recognizes the lady from Jefferson, Representative Van. I'm, do you need a little clarity? <laughs> You know I do because listen, I, I do need it because I'm also coming up here to say this. I may not always agree with my colleagues on a lot of issues just as they do not agree with me. And Re Representative England and I may have our moments. But he's one of the let's most stay on this bill. persons, Mr. Speaker, in this house, and he deserved better than what he just got from this house. We will oh. stay germane to the bill. It is wrong. germane. No, it's not. It's, it's, it's germane to me, but I'm going to be respectful today. I'm used to getting gaveled down. So um, I wanted to know about this bill because you just referenced the fact that just because it's a former colleague's bill that was in the, that moved up to the upper chamber. Yeah, what so, I would reference is that's why we're not moving the House bill in the Senate. We're doing, I'm, I'm glad to do this down here for him since it's his first bill. <clears throat> So we're substituting. No, no, no. Well, they had a Senate version. It's already moved down here, so we're just going to pass the Senate version. Oh, okay. So we're going to. We got a House version up there and a Senate version down here. And this bill does what? It, uh, when the commerce. <clears throat> Excuse me. When the Department of Commerce was founded, they did not put them under the same pay scale metrics as the other cabinet members. And this just brings them into the same pay scale as the other cabinet members of the government. For the Commerce Department? Mm -hmm. So how are they, what's, how is their space, there's a uh, pay sale, excuse me, determined now? It's, uh, it's got its own little, little uh, I'm not exactly, don't have that bill with me right now, but it's, uh, it's set up, the Commerce was established just, you know, not that many years ago, and for some reason they didn't put it under the governor's, the, uh, cabinet structure that's been there for the other cabinet members. Okay, I just wanted to get some, I just wanted to get some clarity, um, clarity on it. I just, I heard you mention the fact that it was a senator who had been a House member, um, and that we were, that you wanted to make sure that he got a bill out. I just hope that same senator does the same when we get to signing that week and move our House bills out. I agree. Mr. Speaker, do we have a count right now as to what's going on? Is it looking okay for the House? Okay, then, all okay, right, well, you can get your gavel out. Because I just want to say now, we, I mean, we had this conversation every year. This is a part of it. Now, if we started moving their bills, we should not be. Well, they're, they're not moving their own bills. They're right not moving now. their own. Okay, well, we're good if they're yeah, not moving yeah. their own bills. But we certainly want to make sure that we get our bills out and we should not be held hostage every year in the 12th hour waiting to move our bills. But I would like to begin keeping an update, sir. I think uh, the rules chairman's got that. Anytime you don't see it, he'll be happy to give it to you. Okay, I 
appreciate. I would like to see it, and I appreciate you not gaveling me down for inquiring. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Question for the body is the adoption of the BIR. Clerk will unlock the machine. The members vote. <laughs> Clerk Lock Machine, record the votes. 102 ayes, 0 nays. BR has been adopted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I ask for final passage of SB 106. Chair recognizes the General for Talladega, Representative Robbins. Hey, Representative Sales. Um, I, we had comments earlier, and I, I just, I'm very pleased with this bill. I think we do need to make the pay for the Commerce Secretary commiserate with all other agencies. But as me and you discussed, and I think it's a conversation we have moving forward, that this is in some ways the most important cabinet level job because it creates the revenue that pays for everything that we do. And that the best way for us to grow economically is to incentivize that in some form or fashion. And I would like, you know, as we move forward, I just want to put that out there that I think we need to have conversations on creating an economic development model where we can incentivize project managers and economic developers on the amount of money they bring into the state and the investment that they bring into the state. And it's a conversation that I think we need to have moving forward. And I just appreciate you wanting to be a part of it. And I look forward to working with you and everybody else yes, on I look the future. To that too. So I've employed people for 20 years and, and incentives go a long way. I mean, every, it's a sales. It does. Yeah. Thank you. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Chair, recognize the general from Clark, Representative Jackson. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I just want to ask the gentleman. Yes, sir. Uh, but you, what, what is the salary of the commerce secretary now? I don't have that with me right now, Mr. Jackson. We already passed this bill one time. I, I, out of the, house. What, the question is, how, how much does the secretary makes now? I'll find out for you. Thank you. And, and it's, uh, and it's, we, undoubtedly, it's not as much as the cabinet members make. Uh, and that's not the reason why the previous secretary left is because he wasn't making enough. Okay, their pay is tied to the highest pay of a married employee is how their pay is done in the Department of Commerce. So this is just put them over into the uh, pay scale with other cabinet members. It's based question, off the, the pay the, of the married employees. The question is, how much is the salary of this commerce secretary? Maybe I'll get that in just a minute. Thank you. See, I'm just asking the question. I mean, we're citizens. We're, 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 we're paying the salary, so we ought to know what they are. Then we're going to raise the salary from what to what? Hey. <laughs> that had nothing to do with the question. Okay. Uh, 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 can anybody tell me the salary of the commerce secretary? I mean, I, I just just asked them a simple question. It's coming. We, we want to raise them from one 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 thing to another. I want to know what we can raise them from, and what we want to put them to, or her, or whoever. There you go. You know, I, why is it getting so quiet in here? They're chewing. Oh, they're eating. Oh, no. okay. I, I, they're getting quiet because I done, I done dug down in something. I, you, you, you say you're going to give me some, some numbers in a minute. Are you, are you waiting on someone to tell you? All right. So, so I, you know, it's, not, it's just being inquisitive. Uh, we want we want to be physical responsible, and that's what we that's not what we talk about being physical responsible to the citizens of this state. Yes, sir. And uh, I wish you'd ask me that. I had that information when I run this bill through the house. The first the first time I brought it through here, we had a house version of this about two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, we was on, what we had on break. But, I mean, two it, weeks was, ago? it was it was two weeks ago at work time. You don't count holidays and off time. Well, I, said, I guess I was, I missed it. I wasn't, I was out in the constituent working two weeks ago. And then uh, last week was spring break again. 
No, I guess I'm asking the wrong question. You know what it is, Mr. Bryce? Uh, and it should, it should be that hard, you know. You're gonna, you're gonna bring a piece of legislation of the, of the raising salary, you don't know the, the basic salary, but we're gonna put them under, under the, the cabinet members. So they're already cabinet members. Yeah, and it just puts them in line with the other cabinet members. <laughs> Cabinet, he, commercial secretary is a cabinet member. They don't get paid the same as this. They don't get paid. That, that's what I was asking. What was the pay? Now, this is a department of personnel bill. Just, I just, I guess I just wait four more minutes. <laughs> Let the clock run out. Well, speaking of, you don't have the answer to this question, do you? Yeah. but nobody does. Somebody got to have the answer to this. I mean, you 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 bringing legislation. You all done all in the, the footwork because you know to be the first thing someone asks. Inquisitive minds want to know, and I'm one of those inquisitive minds. Huh? But do you know what the other cabinet members make? I don't know. That's what I'm. And you're not bringing no bill to raise they raise their salary. That's right. You bring the bill to raise the commerce salary. Yeah, I like the approach Representative Robbins was talking about, where they have an incentive to get paid off of the commission, like an incentive based off their production, how productive they are. I mean, I mean, uh, this, uh, uh, well, in that case, then uh, they, 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 got, they, they got a truck behind them. Well, Go. you, you got to be careful how you do that. But you put some incentive in it. I'm saying you got to be careful how you do that. Because uh, the previous secretary did some, did a almost work bringing industry into this state. So I know he had a wagon when he left. If that be the case, commission. Okay, it looks like the current salary is two hundred and thirty-nine thousand a year. And where are you trying to where are you trying to carry it to? Put it with other cabinet members. I'm not sure what they make. All right. Maybe you may need the cabinet members. Two <laughs> thanks, gentlemen. Question for the body now is final passage of SB 106. Clerk will unlock for seeing the members vote. <laughs> Clerk Lock Machine, record the votes. 100 I, 0 nays. SB 106 has passed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, gentlemen. Clerk, call the next bill. On page five of the calendar, House Bill number 209 by Representative Oliver relating to wake boarding and wake surfing. Chairman Oliver, you're recognized. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, body, under existing law, wakeboarding and wake surfing are regulated and prohibited under certain conditions, including within 200 feet of any shoreline dock or pier or boathouse and other structure on the waters of uh, various lakes. Uh, currently, those are Lewis Smith, uh, Harris at Lake Wadawi, and or on Shoal Creek in Lauderdale County. And their violations that are, are of the law are subject to fines and penalties. This bill would add waters uh, of the state that are impounded by Martin Dam, which is Lake Martin, to the other waters of this law where this law applies. And with that, I'd, I'd like to ask the BIR. That's question for the body's adoption of the BIR. Clerk unlock machine to members of vote. <laughs> yeah, Clerk lock machine, record the votes. 92 ayes, four nays. The BIR has been adopted. Representative Oliver. I've got a floor amendment. Clerk, see the amendment. Amendment to House Bill number 209 by Representative Oliver. Representative Oliver, explain your amendment, please. Uh, the amendment adds uh, Weiss Lake, and Representative Oliver is going to present that. Okay. Chair recognizes the lady from Tuscaloosa, Representative Oliver. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Oliver. I bring this amendment on behalf of Representative Shaver, and I'd like to offer the amendment 
And it is a friendly amendment. Okay, you've heard the explanation of the amendment. It uh, brings in Weiss Lake into it. That's basically all it does. I'm happy to read it, but that is the essence of it. Oh. Clerk unlocks machine and the members vote. <laughs> Clerk locks the machine recorded votes, 85 yeas, zero nays. The floor sub, our floor amendment has been adopted. And I'd like to ask for the final passage. Next question, final passage as amended of HB 209, clerk unlocked the machine, the members vote. <laughs> Clerk Lock Sheen, record the votes. 86 ayes, 5 nays, HB 209 has passed. Thank you. Clerk, call the next bill. On page 17 of the calendar, House Bill number 212 by Representative Keel relating to retirement benefits. Representative Keel, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this bill. Uh, currently in Alabama, uh, there's a process for getting restitution from those who have committed felonies. And this bill will uh, take one step out of that process that is um, it's sort of a bottleneck, and it removes the, uh, the DA's restitution recovery from uh, the current process. And with that, I have called for the BIR. Chair recognizes the lady from Madison, Representative Hall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All of the bills I read, that one I didn't. Could you tell me exactly what we're doing? Sure. If you look, uh, do you have a copy of the bill? I'm thinking. I'm going through it. I looked out because I don't. I didn't see it. Two twelve. Is that what it is? Yes. Okay. All right. That's what I have. So you look said at this it. bill, certain pensions, annuities, retirement, all of that are subject to state and municipal taxes. And so garnishments and other things, and so we're revising that, and what are we saying? Are we increasing the benefits or decreasing the benefits? There's no change to benefits. This is about uh, recovering money, like in a restitution situation. So you can currently do that. Like if you're a retire, if a person who's a retiree commits a felony, say they steal money, then there there's a process to go through to sure. get restitution right. for the person that was wronged. On page four, line 111, on, on page four, Yes. It removes the the line that's the two lines that says the case has been assigned to the district attorney's restitution and recovery division. You don't want that. That's right. What do you want instead? Well, the other provisions still remain. And so uh, the amount of the restitution must be greater than a thousand dollars. The individual subjects to orders are retiree or beneficiary of ERS. Uh, is what will remain. And of course, the rest of the code will remain. That's fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. The question for the body now is the adoption of the BIR. Clerk will unlock the machine. The members will vote. Clerk Lock Machine Court votes under two eyes, zero nays. The BR has been adopted. Representative Keel. Uh, if there's no other questions, I move final passage. That is questions. Final passage of HB 212. Clerk Unlock Machine. The members vote. <laughs> Dropped a couple more, didn't you? Clerk Lock Machine Court votes. 101 I zero days. HB 212 has passed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, gentlemen. Clerk, call the next bill. On page 11 of the calendar, House Bill number eight by Representative Brown with substitute relating to property insurance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I mean, okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have a House Bill eight. Uh, 
what this bill does is it currently under Alabama law, there's no restrictions regarding uh, insurance companies having to tell you uh, any length of time prior to their cancellation, non-renewal, or changing their your, your policy. And what this does is it sets a standard of, they have to give written notice of 30 days prior to, uh, to canceling non-renewal or changing your homeowner's policies. Question for the body now is the adoption of the BIR. Clerk will unlock the machine and the members will vote. <laughs> Clerk will lock the machine and record the votes. 102 out of zero and those BR has been adopted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We had a committee sub, and what this committee sub does is it just changed the, the time frame from 90 days to 30 days, essentially, and uh, changed up some little technical issues on it. Heard the explanation of the committee sub. Clerk will unlock the machine and the members will vote. <laughs> Clerk will lock the machine and court votes. Not 100 eyes, zero nays. Committee sub has been adopted. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With that, I call for final passage. That's questions. Final passage of HBA. Clerk will unlock the machine. The members will vote. Under die, zero nays. HBA has passed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank, Thank you, you, members. Clerk, call the next bill. On page nine of the calendar, House Bill number 105 with substitute by Representative Lee relating to taxation. Chairman Lee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Ellis's bill took care of my bill in the amendment he put on, so I moved to carry it over. Okay, that'd be good. Question carry the bill over. All in favor say aye. aye. It is carried over. Clerk call next bill. On page 14 of the calendar, House Bill number 229 by Representative Bolton relating to state symbols. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, House Bill 229 is a bill that I worked up and carried for uh, the uh, college group and also with the uh, uh, participation of the uh, Native Habitat Project. And all it does is it uh, it's going to name Little blue stem grass, which is uh, the phylum of uh, Schizocerium uh, scoparium, for those of you that are botanists, uh, as our state native grass. And with that, uh, Mr. Speaker, I move for the BIR. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Houston, Chairman Lee. <laughs> Representative Bolton, would you take an amendment to move, remove that and make it wire grass? <laughs> uh, well, I've, uh, I've been here. I've never heard of that type of grass. I, I had never either until I was approached with it. Uh, there's a companion running with HB 225 in uh, in the Senate that uh, basically duplicates this one here, and uh, the organization, the College Republicans, had worked this up and had asked us uh, to carry it. So would you be amenable to changing that to the wire grass? <laughs> well, myself, I wouldn't want to change their bill since they did the work on this. What's the di uh, what is the difference between the wire grass and the uh, blue stem? I don't know what that is, what type of grass that is. <laughs> That's it. I don't yeah. know. Just, uh... All right, thank you. Here, thank you. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Clark, Representative Jackson. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thanks for the recognition. Uh, yes, sir. Could, could you could you uh, tell me what college group you what college group? There's a college Republicans. There's a college Republicans. Oh, yes, sir. I th I'm sorry. I thought I said that. No. So, uh, the governor, the white grass asked about the, the blue stem grass. 
What's so significant about this blue stem grass? It's a, it's a uh, the native habitat project identified it as uh, essential for soil conservation and also it provides uh, habitat for birds and small animals and things. So it's kind of, it grows tall. You don't cut it? Yes, sir. It just grows tall. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. It does. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Do you recognize the lady from Baldwin, Representative Fiddler? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I just, I'm a horticulturist and I was trying to hear that Latin. Can you say the Latin name again? The what now? The Latin name that he, for the blue stem, Gee, little you. blue stem. Thank you for that one. <laughs> Schizocrium scoparium. Schizocrium scoparium. Okay. Um, and so what university did you work with? The college? Uh, college Republicans. The College Republicans put this together along with uh, the Native Habitat Project. Okay, so not Auburn University or no, anybody that, do they specialize in grasses? <laughs> Uh, the Native Habitat Project apparently does, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Chair, thanks to the lady. Question for the body now is the adoption of the BIR. Clerk on the lock machine and the members of vote. <laughs> Well, where is it? Clerk of Lock Machine, court vote, 76 hours, 11 days. BR has passed. Thank you. And with that, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to move for final passage of HB 229. That's questions. Final passage of HB 229. Clerk on Lock Machine, the members vote. Bring the light on. Who is it? <laughs> Can you vote me, Boo? Bob? Thank you. Clerk of Lock Machine, court votes. 63 hours, 22 nays. HB 229 has passed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank, Thank you, Member. Gentlemen. Clerk, call the next bill. On page 28 of the calendar, House Bill number 83 by Representative Estes relating to local boards of education. Representative Estes, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the recognition. Uh, members, this bill here, HB 83, has already passed, as the Senate version has, SB 175 by Senator Chastain upstairs. Uh, what this does is actually two components, uh, compensation or the maximum compensation that can be paid out to school board members across the state is currently $600 a month. Okay. That has not been raised since 2003. This would raise that cap to $900 per month, but let me explain how that works. If this bill is passed and it becomes law, it does not automatically mean a pay raise for local school board members. Each respective board would have to take local action to enact a pay increase, whether it be from 600 to 900, or if they're currently making 300, they go to 650 and do it in incremental steps. They would have to take that action to actually change salary. And any salary change would not become effective until the following term. So therefore, they would have to go through another election or appointment process to take advantage of that pay increase. Secondly, what it does, it kind of goes back and fills in the gaps. Many of you were here back in 2012 when the School Board Governance Act was passed. Okay, Mr. Speaker, I'll ask for the BR. Question for the body is adoption of the BR. Clerk on the lock machine and members will vote. <laughs> Clerk of Lock Machine, record the vote. 102 I 0 nays. BR has been adopted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If there no questions, I'd move for final passage. That is questions. Final passage of HB 83. Clerk on the Lock Machine, the members will vote. <laughs> Clerk of Lock Machine, record the vote 101 I 0 nays. HB 83 has passed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, gentlemen. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Mobile, Pro Tem Pringle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Having agreed to meet at 2 p.m. next Tuesday, I move the House stand in adjournment. All in favor say aye. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa.
One, one minute, one minute, one minute. Sorry. Well, I'm going to pull that back. We got one more uh, piece of business we need to take care of. It's sensitive. So we're not adjourned yet. I didn't gavel out. So uh, with that, Representative Mooney. Thank you, sir, very much. Um, many of you may know uh, the name John Michael Colin. Mike Colin uh, is an All-American, an All-Pro. He's the only person from our state to ever play on an undefeated NFL football team. But beyond that, Mike Colin is a personal hero to me and a dear friend who gave me my start in commercial real estate. I met my wife at his home at a Bible study. He and his wife, Nancy, have mentored us most of our lives. He died. Uh, Monday morning about 2.30 and uh, I'm offering a time-sensitive resolution mourning the death and the celebration of life of John Michael Colin. Clerk, see the resolution. Resolution from Representative Mooney. All those in favor? Say aye. Any opposed? The resolution has been adopted. And if there's no uh, opposition, if we could list everyone in the House on it. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Here, here, no. Any opposition? Here, none. Everybody will be listed. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Chair recognizes a uh, lady from Madison, Representative Hall. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. I think we've just decided to send it to rules and to do the House resolution. Yeah. Which did, did she give you the name? Okay. It's all right. I think we're taking. All right. Thank you. What is it? I'd like to recognize Dustin Jones, our physical, works in the physical office. Uh, his parents are here from Mississippi. Let's give him a big Alabama welcome. Thank y'all. He does a great job for us. Thank you. Mr. Pro Tim, let's try that one more time. I'd like to renew my motion to House stand <laughs> and adjournment. All in favor say aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>